Hello, everybody. Uh, well, Kelly, as you noticed, is not here. I have him locked up in the back room because I figured he was taking way too much of the uh, uh, MC uh, front of house jobs. Uh, he may actually be logged on as an attendee just so he learns how it's really done. Uh, today, we've got a great bunch of people from a show that I worked on for two or three years, uh, uh, which shall remain unnamed. But this is basically the audio crew and the and the uh, the uh, head of uh, really was uh, the production manager. He's the one who got us all started every single day, uh, half an hour before our real call time, and made us all stand in a straight line and tell us what we were all going to do. That that's Mark Brown. Uh, uh, John Steiner is the PA uh, A one. Uh, Chris Sakai is the PA A two. He also knows how to do mixing for front of house and the truck and the other things. So he's basically, Jack, uh, how you say, Chris of all trades. Uh, and Jason Lynch is the um, uh, TV mix. And I, I just did comp, so that's nothing there. Anyway, we're going we're gonna to get started now. Uh, Mac is going to give a quick little uh, ex exor exor exorcist moment on, uh, on uh, questions. Yeah, for the, for the for the two newcomers, uh, I'm, I see the list is looks very familiar. So I'm pretty sure everyone has heard the little spiel uh, um, more than once. But as always, uh, you can ask questions throughout the webinar. In there, in the go to webinar control panel, there's a little pull down that says questions, has a box for you to enter your questions into. Um, only the uh, presenters will see the questions. Other attendees will not see the questions, but we will see them and we will either address them in real time as they appear or we will address them at a Q&A section as we, you know, break down the presentation. When you ask a question, because it may not be answered right away, please be very specific about what you're asking about because five minutes later, it may not register what you're talking about unless you're specific and the same goes for comments that may not be seen for you know five minutes while the presentation is going on um, but please answer ask as many questions as you like we will answer as many of them as we can uh, if we don't get to everybody's individual questions we will at least try to get to every topic uh, and with that i think um I think we should get okay, started. Okay, Jason, you can uh, open the uh, screen and uh, Mark can take it away. All right, uh, good, e good evening. Um, my name is Mark Brown and I'm the head of events at Esports Engine in Columbus, Ohio. Prior to my employment with Esports Engine, I was the CEO of Any Productions LLC, who now my wife runs. Uh, over the five years, we produced over 38 large scale esports events around the country. That's hundreds of LED tiles, projection mapping, custom stages, TV trucks, thousands of spectators in venue, and millions of viewers online. Over the past five years, on the broadcast side alone, we've come a long way. Our first show was in New Orleans, and we had four eight input TriCasters, eight JVC GY HD 250 cameras and who could forget the O1 V96s and the DM1000s, all hooked up analog. Um, now we're maxing out Dante infrastructures using every camera input on a 53 foot Expando TV truck and close to 60 video inputs, four 12 channel EVSs. We've come a long way in five years, uh, but so has the entire esports ecosystem. Um, one of the things that uh, not only do we do the primary broadcast, but we also have done several uh, subsidiary broadcasts, which is our, our um, Bravo, Delta, and Charlie broadcast. So a lot of times we're actually setting up uh, four separate fly packs plus the live TV trucks. And all of these uh, pieces of hardware have to talk to one another. Comms have to work across multiple um, announcers, IFBs have to work across multiple casters, um, and um, uh, everything then gets dumped into the main TV truck 
and that's where we run our primary A or alpha broadcast. Uh, with that, I'm going to throw to Jason Lynch, who's our TV A1. Hello, everybody. My name is Jason Lynch. Uh, I am primarily a sports uh, A1, uh, but I do a fair amount of other things, uh, including what I call the, the weird stuff. Uh, I am uh, hired uh, by Lion Video for a lot of the things. I'm Lion Video's dedicated weird stuff guy. Um, when they get drone racing and they don't know what to do about it, about the audio, they call me. When I get video, when they get video games and they don't know what to do about the audio, they call me. I've done horse racing for them. I've done everything else. Um, but I spend most of my time doing sports, a uh, little bit of talking head politics and uh, things like that. Um, but I really like shows like this because it really forces me to get outside of my comfort zone. It really forces me to uh, rethink what I know television to be. And I really like that challenge. And this was definitely a challenging show. Now, I came into this show very late. Um, John uh, predates me by quite a bit. And John was responsible for uh, the majority of the buildup that I walked into and then basically took and modified to the point that we got it a really well greased machine. Um, and John, if there's anything you want to talk about, about uh, where your front of house stuff came from and went, now would be a good time for that. Well, hi, I'm John Steiner. I was based in the States before and working as an audio engineer. My background is originally more um, music, concerts, recording in studios, um, but I eventually started doing more corporate things through local work I had in New York because there's every possible kind of that kind of work in New York. And actually had an association with Mark Brown for, I think it's fair to say decades, uh, going back with productions that he was involved with, both in music, in um, uh, faith, church service kind of stuff, um, and all kinds of productions, uh, including the crossover of music into TV production, where we worked on several combined video and music projects together, uh, going back a long time. Um, Let's see. Well, now I'm not in New York. I'm quite far away. So if there's any internet problems, it's probably because I'm in Bangkok, Thailand right now, where I live with my family. So hopefully it'll hold up. There's a thunderstorm coming, but we'll see. Um, so the work that I've been doing when we started out, as Mark said, uh, this was a very basic production in terms of audio. And most of the aspects of it were pretty basic. Um, I started with Mark on this first show as we both came on that project together on the first show together. And it was uh, a very large space in New Orleans uh, across three different stages, running three different uh, games. Um, and we spent more time, I think, working on the comm system than any of the other elements because everything else was so simple. We, we really, we, and Mark's nodding because we were running fiber all over the place, but today we run everything across fiber and then it was just the comms. Um, and a uh, very basic audio setup. Each behind the stage was a very small mixer, and those would feed their, their sends to one central console, which would put sound out on the big PAs, which we had very little to do with. We weren't really controlling that. And the mixes that were created were rudimentary. They were really made for TV, and then they were just ported out into speakers. And I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit more about how we've developed mixes that are more customized for an audience and need to be sort of isolated, separately mixed, so that they fit the the the, the needs. Because a, a TV mix sounds great for TV, but it doesn't always work well at all for um, an audience. And there are considerations we have to take into account for when some of our presentation the, the the presenters are out in the audience, and we have to accommodate acoustic feedback issues and um, echoes coming back into uh, performance microphones, which end up causing problems for them for their own intelligibility and um, making echoes that end up in the broadcast. So um, part of the path that we took was um, deciding how to split off audio and allow the, the mixing jobs to become separate. But we ended up doing it in uh, similar hardware. In fact, one of the, I don't know if this is where we'll talk about that, but we, um, we were able to actually get all of the television production and all of the PA distribution of audio uh, and all of the various mixing that has to happen separately and with some combined elements 
in one console. We were doing it in an LS9, actually. That was the first time that we had enough um, inputs and outputs and uh, DSP on the on board the console to manage a task like that. And we actually were we were at the point we very much tapped out the ability of that console, and that was still all just using analog ins. We weren't there were no digital cards in it, and we were able to run a complete broadcast with several different outputs, including um, mixes for IFBs for talent, um, mixes for crew to hear the program on comm, um, alternate language mix. So there were some mix minuses and all of the outputs necessary to run a PA, um, including a distribution of sound through different parts of the, the line arrays. And I'll, I'll end up talking about why we needed to be able to have that kind of control over it because of as I said, there was talent out in the audience and sometimes we would have to adjust the PA to make sure that we weren't gonna get feedback. We'd actually have to shade down a little portion of the PA to accommodate um, placements of um, performers, um, casters, we like to call them, uh, out in the audience, sometimes literally right in front of speakers. Um, it, was, it looked great on camera and it was a decision made by our video directors, um, but we would have to clean up the mess acoustically afterwards and make that work. Um, yeah, but we do know. have a section where we're going to talk about uh, about that stuff. OK, great. So I'll hand um, it to, I'll hand it to, I guess, Mark can talk about sort of the overarching, how do we put together something that's so large? Um, how do we, in terms of the, like the planning stage, how do we do our pre-production? And how do we make everything happen magically? We show up with what's essentially uh, an entire warehouse worth of equipment, all in, in cases and carts and transport, um, and build shows, and in, in fact, entire television production studios right there on the floor behind the stage on tables until we incorporated the video trucks. And we were doing that um, building, as Mark said, several different fly packs all integrated, in, you know, connected together. So I'll pass that to Mark, I think. So what was interesting about this in our client actually owned a decent amount of gear um, from power distribution to um, some consoles, um, some lights, a lot of televisions, a whole lot of Xboxes and Playstations and monitors uh, galore and mix amps and things like that. Um, so it was a mismatch where we had to find um, a production company that would work with us that wouldn't feel like they had to come in and take over everything, um, but at the same time would partner with us and know that we were willing um, to go the distance with them. Um, so uh, we began to really um, finesse a relationship with one of our um, production partners and um, we're able to have them take care of like some of the heavier lifting things. Because originally we didn't own any LED either. If we would rent all of our LED, we would rent all of our projection, um, we would rent all of our lighting, we would rent um, all of our our sound as well. Um, and then as we started to take over portions of it, um, it was great because we had a great relationship where they didn't feel like, well, you're pulling this back from me, and now I have nothing else to hold on to, and I'm going to charge you more because you're giving us less work if you will um but we were able to massage that that relationship and um be able to produce these things but uh i mean the our, our client ha owns you know a lot they owned all the tricasters at the time they owned all the the um o1v 96s and the dm 1000s they owned all the cabling and cabling infrastructure to get from console to console um uh, a little bit of fiber uh, but most of the stuff was analog and, you know, basically we would show up with three tractor trailers full of stuff. And for the audio side, I got a lot of prep time designing the lighting, designing the LED looks and stuff like that. But um, audio really didn't get a whole lot of time to tech. Like I kind of threw a lot of stuff on John Steiner. He's a, he was a lead engineer and the lead designer for audio. So a lot of times we would get there and be like, hey, John by the way, you're going to have to do this, this, and this. Oh, and they're going to they're gonna make stuff I didn't even know about. They're going to make PA announcements that need to go into the open bracket area where there's 400 gaming stations set up over there. And But they only want the announcements to go there. And we want you to duck 
the audio from the uh, the info desk when they're making announcements of who's up next in the gaming circle or whatever. Um, but he would get a lot of that last minute and basically say, all right, here's all my pieces and put it together and come up with a great solution um, to the point that we actually started to uh, do a little pre do a little pre prep work um, and get him involved a little bit earlier so he knew what was going on when he walked into the show. One of the reasons I think we needed to have that much gear in place is because each one of our shows had a really different footprint. Certain things were in the same areas, but a lot of times the, either the show was designed intentionally to be set up differently or we were in, within the constraints of the venue. So we couldn't really build pre-made uh, um, harnesses with everything sort of pre-wired. It was never really the same the next show, even when we would put certain pieces of gear together that we knew we would like to use. Most of the time, that arrangement didn't work for the next show. We ended up tearing whatever that was apart. And that was a constant element of having to reinvent it sort of on the fly, on the ground, each show. Because other touring types of events, you know, you can kind of pre-build stuff and reuse a lot of things. We rarely got a chance to do that. So we spent an enormous amount of time constructing from scratch. And that's why we needed a whole warehouse perched behind us to be able to put that kind of thing together every time. That was a big part of it. And literally it was a warehouse. <laughs> we took the entire the, the entire 7,000 square foot warehouse and put it on a truck and sent it to job. And we we actually put the show together on site. The, obviously video, we had, a, we had wiring diagrams and stuff like that, but audio really kind of was an afterthought at the time, you know, five years ago. Audio is always an afterthought in everything, whether it's broadcast, whether it's front of house, it doesn't matter what it is, it's always an afterthought. Pete, do you have anything before we move on? Well, the, the interesting thing, I joined the show in the last two years uh, before it disappeared. And what I found interesting is the crew, which was about maybe 30, 40 people, all knew how to do this because they'd done it a, a dozen or two more, two dozen times before. And they all had their routine down. And mostly they just had to see the basic drawing and every pretty much every place we went into was similar but different enough so there were all these customized things that had to be done. So it was a, a, quite an interesting group of people to work with. And I will say it was it's probably one of the most flexible crews I've ever worked with. Uh, there are some shows where minor changes become huge deals. Uh, there are some shows that are relatively flexible, and this was one of those shows where, oh, what's that? This main key piece of show is going to move 1,700 feet in that direction, and we need to get all of these things to it. All right, we'll find a way to do it. It was it, it was a really good working environment. We had a solid group of people, I think, from every on every aspect of the show. It was really, really solid. Um, and so, yeah, so let's start talking about uh, the show and let's start talking about the arable content. Um, before we get into the show, uh, before we get into why we did things in the show, let's actually show you the show because esports is one of those things that, uh, first of all, there's not a lot of different e show, e esports shows, uh, but all of them that are out there tend to do things vastly different. So I'm going to show you, and you have to forgive me as I have to do this uh, uncomfortable reach, um, but I'm going to show you a little bit of the aired content uh, that we had so you have a, a feel for what the actual show looked in, and more importantly for this uh, broadcast sounded like. So here we go. Two, 25 now for Optic, 25 for the win. Sun comes through. Attack five is there. Dr. Abner's prescription is soon going to be streaks. The lightning strike will be his after one more kill. Dashi finds it from behind. Scumpy now. He's got full streaks to work with. Ten now for the win. This is going to be it. This is going to be the three-one. Optic once again. They get it done in three. It is not quite over yet, but the streaks are going to be there. Number eight's coming in from behind. Got X is going to get on point, but he can't do it. It's a three-one. E6 will fall to the losers bracket. And Optic Gaming add another notch onto the belt here at Champs. You can see the comeback happening. E United can do it. The ping in, the call in. Here comes the lightning. One's a team kill, but two do drop for EG. C6 
Sips gonna end up falling. Of course, it's Anthony for the kill, but on the flank, it's gonna be Clayster. And Clayster's gonna get a bump. Four gonna drop for EG. EG only needs six points. Now it's hit for E United. EG is spawning out. They're trying to rally back in. E United can get it to a map five here. There's no contest. And E United with the comeback. What, what is going on? What is happening? <laughs> what is happening? And much like Maven, if you're not used to esports, you're probably asking yourself, what is happening? Um, and so basically what you're looking at right now is our program feed. This is, uh, this is Twitch. Uh, this was one of several different uh, broadcast sources that we had, or I'm sorry, broadcast destinations that we had. Uh, we also streamed to uh, uh, the the particular uh, website uh, of the company we were working for. Uh, we t uh, sent another stream to uh, PlayStation, which had its own complications. We'll get into a little later. Um, and we had so we had all of these different online uh, destinations for this content, and each one of them had their own difficulties and as you can see twitch chat if you have if you're unfamiliar with twitch chat twitch chat is the sh it's it's just as interesting as the show that we're putting on i mean yeah we have a bunch of like jibs and handheld cameras and you know we have steady cams and everything else but twitch chat i mean watching those words fly by that's that's entertainment i mean i that's that's just is it's the show so let me go back to uh our lovely powerpoint here And we will discuss why Dante became the solution. Um, very particularly for this show, um, there's three main pieces that we have to deal with. The first main piece is John. It's the front of house show. Because really, if, if we only talk about the show that we're putting on, we have a front of house show with a bunch of people that are in the venue that we have to take care of. And then we also have an aired show. So starting from the front of house perspective, all of the announcers that are on the webcast are also on in the building. That means very specific things. It means every microphone is closer to or farther away than a speaker stack. It means that uh, you know different places we go with RF microphones and handhelds, uh you know there's different complications with the eq involved in that all of my other microphone sources for the show either need to or don't need to go to air at any particular time uh you know for example team chats uh you know are, are a sponsored element that we ended up sending to everywhere but the effects mics and the screaming that's not the sort of thing you need to put into the house so you had to build very gradient uh paths you, you had to build paths that really were flexible in what you sent and what you didn't send. And then on top of that, we ended up grouping a lot of our audio because just the same, John not only needs the individual microphones to make sure he can EQ and pan and feedback eliminate and everything else, but certain things need to sound certain ways. If we have a switcher wipe, maybe that's too loud or too quiet in the mix uh, in mine compared to his. If we have video game sounds, maybe they need to be a little more percussive in his mix. You know, the gunfire really needs to hit as opposed to mine where it kind of has to fight announcers in a different manner. Uh, we, we broke things out across a bunch of different subgroups specifically to accommodate that. So we had several sub mixes all being sent to John, uh, as well as things John was sending back to me as well as individual microphones that had to be eq differently for air and for his show so it becomes a lot of stems running back and forth between john and i uh john if there's anything you want to jump into uh, about the difficulties in that uh feel free well when we started doing the production as a separate entity the live production and the production for tv all in one console i built a construct in the console that did this stemming, this summing of various groups of things together so that uh, parts from the uh, television production could show up on the PA portion of the console on a different layer as stems, and they were much more controllable. It was, it was only a certain number of things that you could manage 
because I was mixing while while Chris, who you see on your screen, who hasn't spoken yet, Chris was actually managing the TV mix at the front of the console. I was logged into the console with my iPad controlling, remote controlling the, the PA side. And it was useful to have some pairing down of, of all of the inputs into some stems. It, it made acoustic sense in, in the construct of the console, but also just in terms of controllability. Because I would stand out in the in the house somewhere, remote mixing the entire show for the for the PA. Chris would be behind the stage at the console mixing the TV mix. And I would take useful input from the mix that he was doing and utilize some of that on my side. So although I had a separate signal path for some of my microphones, I didn't want to have to be able to stand out in the audience and follow as closely along from the director as he was in an environment it would be harder to hear by and, and uh, having less control surface to work with. When Chris would bring up a microphone, I had his fader linked to the fader on my layer that was running in the house. So as he usefully turned things up and down according to what the director was calling was happening in the house, that auto mixed some portions of the of the show for me. And that worked out to be a really effective system. And that was all happening inside one console. Um, and the the big job that we had when when Jason first came aboard was figuring out a way to slice those two things that were inside a console in half, take the whole TV production put it into the truck and still be able to maintain all of that interconnected, all in one box uh, linkage to make that still behave the same way across uh, what we did across the Dante network. And uh, I'll talk to yeah, you, I'll definitely talk more in detail about it, about how we sort of broke that up in the decision-making process. One subject, yeah, and that kind uh, of brings us, oh, one question regarding what you're just saying, uh, uh, Eric Kimmel asked, Sub submix groups. How many different groups did you run? Uh, I would say offhand, I think there was eight passing between you and I that did not include vocals because the vocals were individual stems. I think that sounds about right, doesn't it? Uh, yeah, I think we had gameplay. There were two different music plays. There was a separate 24-hour uh, music rolling that was always on that was, came from the truck that I had access to. There was... Um, the tape playback, playback from of, the truck. Tape playback. There was a pair of channels that was dedicated to the um, the uh, team chat. There was mm -hmm. switcher sound effects. Uh, did did yep, you TV add live and commercials? Did you add reverb yeah, to the casters? I'm sorry. Did you add reverb to the casters? Who are you asking? <laughs> Anybody? Uh, no. I had plenty of reverb to spare where I was standing. Um, I I have only ever added any kind of reverb when someone was performing, literally performing, like singing a national anthem or some other event like that. But in the, the, the in the TV mix, there was no added reverb to the casters. Did you do no, any because there was a fair amount of uh, of slapback from the environment. You know, there was that was actually one of the challenges that we had to work through was. You know, the the worst thing in television is when you have an open speaker and you can hear your announcers through the open speaker because then there's reverb and slapback. Well, okay, now so that was we're a lot in of closed yeah, venues. Yeah. Right. So we're in closed venues, which aren't outdoors. So it's not like college football. And then on top of that, you know, depending on how the building was, maybe uh, one set of announcers like the analysts have to be in front of the delay stack. You know, yeah, maybe yeah, yeah, the yeah. casters have to be off to one side of the the main stack. You know, it was very physically dependent on the venue as well. So I actually did everything I could to fight the reverb. You know, it, it kind of created. I mean, you kind you, you kind of heard as well as you can on computer audio. You know, it created this this cool little like echo effect, and it really kind of energized the crowd. Yeah. Uh, but, but it's it all also, a balance to make it, it not also sound kept terrible. it extremely clear. I one of the things I noticed out in the house with a thousand people screaming their heads off, just like at an NFL game, every announcer, every voice coming through the PA was clear in the whole room, even recorded on, on, on my iPhone. It just sounded like it was a direct feed into my iPhone. Well, that was part yeah, of the there was a that lot was of thought that went into that. The, the, the mix that was custom crafted for the house included the ability to balance elements coming yeah. through the PA. Now there's a there's a maximum amount of headroom I can get out of the PA and a sports crowd can get, well, let's just say really, really loud. And um, having the elements as a separate thing that I could control allowed me to not just make it louder, which eventually you just top out your PA, 
I could pull some things back, making more space in the headroom of the PA to have the announced parts be yeah. more legible yeah. and have more power. Um, being able to yeah. dynamically change that according to how much other noise was happening in the venue was another real important reason why we had to have these as separate elements. And one of the reasons we were able to get such exquisite control over the sound, which helped for keeping the audience being able to hear things clearly, but also not to create such a huge cacophony that it all came back in through the announcer's mics, uh, messing up the broadcast sound, and also through the um, the audience mics. I How wanted to the... comment that the, the clip that you heard before, um, you know, it's, games are so amazing these days. They come with every sound you need, including some sports games that have the crowd built in. If you were listening to that and it seemed reminiscent of some sort of really great sound, you know, game sound effect, that's not the case. That was our real live audience, expertly captured with very carefully placed microphones and constantly mixed in and balanced to what was happening. Um, fortunately for us, they made plenty of good sound for us, but capturing that and incorporating it into the mix, that wasn't a sound effect. That was Jason working those microphones constantly in the they truck. Were, they were very, uh, very uh, vocal, that, those crowds. I mean, I couldn't believe and, how and loud they were screaming and yelling. Yeah, very specifically to that point, um, there were, you know, obviously I showed, I, I gave you two clips of really high energy things that happen, you know, not everything is like that. There are certain game modes and certain games where everything is really quiet and it's a stalking mode. And so everything is, you know, you could hear a pin drop in the venue. Well, you have even worse problems there because now in order to hear anything, you have to turn up the effects mic so loud that it's just an open, empty, you know, it's like yelling in your bathroom. You know, it's so it was a constant fight between is this game mode loud or is it quiet? Is this, you know, are there fans for this particular thing? Optic Gaming, one of the ones I showed, uh, they had quite a fan base. You know, there, there was a lot of people that came with them. You know, they were always loud and they were always screaming. So if it was, you know, an Optic match, which was one of the uh, teams in, in that particular game, there was always a ton of people. Well, let's say yeah, there was yeah. someone from an open bracket or someone else, you know, some other team that didn't have a big following. There's not many people there. So then you have to make, you know, at least the air content sound entertaining without as many people yelling. And that's that was a, a completely different challenge for me. And that's why we spent a lot of time thinking about the crowd microphone placement and where it was going to hang in in not only in the the venue space, but in relation to where the speakers were and the delay columns were. And, you know, oftentimes, as as Mark was saying, we're running six or seven different PAs. We have an entry PA. We have, you know, an open bracket PA. We might have, you know, what we call the birthday cake, which is a different type of game mode. We have, uh, you know, the, the B stream. We have all of these different PAs all in the same enclosed space. So you have to be able to pick only the sound out that you want although it may be incredibly loud or incredibly quiet and not bring the rest of the elements in. And so, and with that, I'll kind of talk about the, uh, the broadcast side, which is the second element of, of how we design, you know, the, this show around Dante. Um, so the main broadcast, which I, which I ended up being responsible for, um, we did it very WWE style. And, uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, how WWE works, uh, Frenchie is the mixer that mixes WWE, and he's amazing. I absolutely love the guy. He's super nice, and uh, I've been invited into the production more than a couple of times, and I've gotten to see all of the uh, the inner workings of the show. And I can tell you, it was you know the 14 year old me's absolute dream. It was it was wonderful to hear how all of that stuff works. Um, but Frenchie is working on a single mixer and is mixing almost the majority of both shows, both the in-house show and the front of house show. He's actually got a double stack Apollo um, with two faders and every source is on both faders. And he can dynamically grab one thing out of, let's say the air show. So let's say they play entry music and there's someone walking down. Well, then the television has to go to a recap of something that happened last week. He can dynamically go to another section, pull out only the stuff that's going to TV and then execute that element and then come back and rejoin everything else that's going to PA. And to watch him do it, it's a symphony. It's absolutely amazing to watch him do it. Uh, that's how we kind of had to design this show. Um, as John said, you know, when, uh, when the mixers were the same and you could do multiple flying faders across boards, it's super simple. But now I'm running on a CalRec and he's running on Yamaha boards. They don't really talk the same language. I can't do flying fader quite the same way. So we created a way for me to mix both shows 
90% of the time until it came time for John to do something else. So let's say we go to a commercial uh, that doesn't air in the house. Um, so that commercial airs for us. John can bring up his own commercials through his own playback source. John can uh, bail to one of our wireless mics where someone might be giving away, uh, you know, swag or headsets or something in the crowd. Um, you know, so we we built it so that he can join me for 90% of the show. So there's, because there's no reason for us to double mix the show. I'm responsible for making sure whatever has to be heard gets heard. There's no reason for, you know, us both to do that. Uh, and then John can simply duck away when he needs to and when it's responsible. And in order to do that in CalRec world, it was actually really difficult. And this is this is the one place where I'm going to call out CalRec. And I've I've said this to them many many times, and I, I'm going to beg them one more time: please, please, please consider rewriting your DSP. Before it was because the CalRec console doesn't have a hard brick wall limiter. They have a thing that they call a comp lim but the limiter doesn't actually limit because you can't set it to zero attack. So it's not a brick wall limiter. It always lets something else through. And as I always say to them, that's not a limiter. That's a really, really hard compressor. In our particular case, the challenge that we had was uh, I had to send every microphone that I'm airing to John, but I had to send it post fader and pre-EQ, because I have my own EQ to make sure that everything meshes well in my show. You know, again, mixing for uh, three inch computer speakers is vastly different than mixing a front of house setup. So I have to make my microphone sound good in my world, and I also have to not screw up John's world, because if I re-EQ his show, I get instant feedback, and not the good kind of feedback, the bad kind of feedback. So we had to do a post-fade, pre-EQ, which the CalRec DSP doesn't allow. And so we basically had to take every microphone and re-enter it back into the console once it was post-fader into another layer, slave those faders together, and then send all of those faders out a separate path that landed to John and individual stems. And it was a nightmare. We got it done and it worked. But a really, really simple thing, like just rewriting where you can pick things out of the CalRec DSP would be wonderful. So please, 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 CalRec, just if, if you get some extra time, just please. If you're listening, rewrite it. The, the dynamic range uh, of the shows is really high, as, as John said. But how do you manage the input mic gain structure of the casters since they could overload at any time? And that was really tough. So the, the particular hardware we used, which we'll get into a couple slides from now, uh, we used uh, Studio Tech Dante announce boxes. And you can set those remotely, the, the microphone gain remotely, which was nice, but you kind of had to find the happy medium because for it to be loud enough uh, for most of the content, you got it to a point where it was bringing in so much of the background noise in the front of house that it was really rough to air. So, and you can only do so much with auto mixing and other tricks. Uh, so we had to kind of find that happy medium to where we could get enough percussion out of it. And also the other real important thing is, again, there's certain game modes that are stalking modes and certain game modes that are free for alls. So there are some points when the announcers start talking like this and there's someone creeping around the corner and, oh my God, it's gonna be, oh my God. And obviously you're gonna clip the, you know, the input of your box when that happens. So you have to, come up with dynamic headroom to the point where when they start screaming their head off, like Maven was screaming his head off in that clip, it doesn't clip the overall program, but there's still enough signal in there to get what you need out of it, but there's not too much signal in it to get, you know, the the, right. the front of house stuff out. What, so what, it was, what headsets it really were they difficult. actually using? What headsets were they actually using? They were one of the, uh, do you remember the specific model number? They're one of the lower end Sennheiser announced headsets. They were the HMD 280s. HMD 280s. And, and, and yeah. um, what about Chris, crowd mic everybody. ambience? Everybody. Uh, crowd mics were uh, kind of a different bag. It really depended on uh, the venue. Uh, I have a personal stash of uh, some VP88s. I use those sometimes if I had near field crowd. Uh, some of the venues are really tightly packed, so I would uh, hide a microphone on the stage right in front to get the right. near field sound. Uh, some right. of the other stuff, if I had the ability to go wide, I would use 416s, but the 416s, if you ever look at the pattern, are just as wide as they are forward. 
So that wasn't always an option. So sometimes we had to go with the uh, the MKEs, uh, you know, for uh, different spots. We had to use uh, one of the ATs over the 80s, 70s. I can't remember what they were, but we had to really tailor the microphone on the room and what we were trying to pick up and how much we could cone out because sometimes that cone had to be really, really narrow. Otherwise, you'd get right. a ton of stuff. Right. Several Going people to have asked of how you get. Mic also, is a problem. You don't want to pick up a very, very narrow band because then right. you just basically hear two or three One people person, screaming. Right. So you want to One be able to get far enough way to pick up a good crowd, but not so far you pick up there's too much other noise around it. There's a lot of time. Several people. Several people have asked how you get sound out of the game, and I'm sure we'll cover this in the next section. That's a good we question. will absolutely cover that in the next section. Yeah. Um, so we'll talk about that uh, one of the, that's right. We'll talk about one of the other uh, little pieces that uh, we were able to design, and it was based around the uh, the Studio Tech announce boxes. Um, again, you always try to find a solution for the problem, and one of the problems we have is uh, so what you see uh, on the PowerPoint is you see what we call the analyst desk on the left. And then you see what we call the casters on the right. So the analyst desk in sports world would be like the pre-post desk. And the caster desk on the right would be like the booth. You know, that would that would be how you consider it to a, like a regular sports A1. So a lot of times games and quickly things happen. Uh, you know, some of the games tend to crash. You know, the server goes down. There's uh, an improper spawn or some rule violation, something like that. And sometimes we have to uh, change things quickly. Um, we had a problem where the the talent would have to talk amongst themselves and wouldn't be on headset. So of course we'd go to call them in their IFB, they wouldn't be there. You can't exactly put a stage announce out because the venue's so loud they wouldn't hear it anyways. So what we designed was this thing that we called Buddy Chat. And the particular studio tech announce boxes that we had had two talkbacks. So we used the first talkback for the truck and then we used the second talkback to talk amongst themselves at the desk. And the advantage that gave us was that they could talk to themselves, they could turn up and down the program volume and everything else, uh, but they could keep their headsets on while they were talking to each other. So that way, if for some reason we had to panic and bail back to a desk, if there was a technical glitch or something else, we had them on headset. So we were able to design certain features that you know maybe weren't exactly the way the boxes were meant to be used, but really fit our use case well and, and helped us out. Um, on those on those studio tech boxes, did you hear? Did any of them have a distortion when you were overloading it when they were yelling at it? Uh, uh, particularly the mic as as output the game properly from the IFB. Uh, it took some working to to get the right setting for that, but yeah, yeah it, it took boxes, it took quite a bit of uh, a setting for them. So it, sometimes you the the built-in compressor was we we had it engaged, but uh, it's not the most musically or it's it's not the the best compressor for all purposes so we usually tried to get a gain level that would not quite engage it too far and certainly not uh have so much gain that it would overdrive when they would scream. It, was, it was more <laughs> peaking protection than anything this yeah. uh, they, those announcers the casters were uh a little more extreme than most announcers would be Yes. These are, uh, these I've, I've are, done many shows with are, Gus Johnson, and these yeah. guys are on another level compared to Gus Johnson. These yes. guys are veteran game players, so they get yeah. really, really involved in it while they're talking. And another person asked where the actual casters were. They, well, they were basically uh, off in the balcony, maybe, or backstage. They weren't not down front cent center. The, the, uh, the, uh, the, the uh, analyst desk. Usually, as my, you can see, because it ha has has the audience has the stage in the background, who's right out in the house. Go ahead, Mark. I did my best to put the casters right in front of the PA whenever I could. You did <laughs> a good job. Like I said, you you, 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 you love John so here. much. Exactly. exactly. Probably the yes. greatest running joke of our <laughs> operation. Where are the casters yes. going to show up? <laughs> no, honestly, um, uh, at the beginning, I really didn't floor plan somewhere uh but then going through it uh i tried my best it, it was a it, it was a two it was a double-edged sword because um broadcast team wanted the casters to be dead center or someplace right visible right in the middle of everything and the the issue was i'm like hey we can have it here but just understand you're not gonna get the head the head 
the headroom that you want to get out of the PA because they're sitting right in front of the speakers. Um, but I think that we got like if you're looking at the the picture on the left hand side, that was up in the the the, the second mez, no, the first mez um, of uh, UCLA, um, and that was off to the side, out almost outside of the, where the PA was. But it was still a lot of work to, to you know, to make it in a situation where there wasn't going to be a lot of feedback. Mm -hmm. And so uh, the last thing I want to talk about in this particular slide is uh, the, one of the other things that's a little different for the TV side than normal. Um, there's there's some similarities, some some similarities. So. Uh, we have uh, multiple feeds uh, feeding different streaming services, as we were talking about. Um, a lot of different shows we fed an international feed, uh, which would, uh, you know, it's basically the same as a world feed where you uh, take most of the announcers out, but you leave some of the announcers in. Um, but there were also extra weird things like certain brands weren't allowed to be on certain streaming services certain services wouldn't allow commercials to be ran so there was a lot of work that we had to do to mute certain feeds at certain times you know at the same time that the td would cut the video feed away we'd have to cut the audio feed away and certain triggers that we had to do uh to make that happen and we'll talk about that in a little bit um so the third piece of uh this structure was the sub broadcast uh, and a lot of the uh, games that we did we had what we call a b stream which was uh, the same fly pack configuration that they started off with before we started using tv trucks um, doing a secondary game so uh, a lot of the games would have an a a b a c and a d uh, that each went through a bracket structure usually the brackets were double elimination and so if you were in the A, if you were in, if you were on the A stream, you were on the main stage. If you were on the B stream, you had your own dedicated set of announcers that would do their own play-by-play. -play. If you were on the C and the D stream, most of the time it would just be a direct stream of the game that you could watch on one of the streaming services. Uh, in this particular photo, you can see the black dividers. This actually had all of the substreams, all with their own announcers. This was, uh, I believe, Columbus. It was, uh, it was the final, so it was, you know, a little more important for everyone to have their own set of announcers. Um, but these separate streams also have to have the ability to dip in and out of the resources of everybody else. For the most part, they're on an island, um, but some of them. So, like in a typical setup. Uh, if the, the B stream has its own set of announcers, there's a different spot in the building where if you're watching the B stream, you can go and stand and listen to your announcers cast your game. So they have their own front of house element that's mostly set it and forget it. Um, has a little bit of tweaking that you can do, but it's done through their console. So their guys mixing their own front of house that's for the most part unmonitored, not entirely unmonitored. Um, they have their own set of IFBs, their own wireless microphones, uh, their own music laptops, uh, though they have the ability, let's say their music laptop were to crash. Uh, I have a set of music that runs 24 hours a day that we feed to, you know, gates when doors open, we feed, you know, certain things. They have the ability to bail to that if they have a, a, a different, you know, some technical problem with their laptop. Um, their stream may need to dip into an A bracket, a C bracket, or a D bracket game because that may have implications for their stream. Uh, often on the A show, we were waiting for a B show to finish uh, and it completely changed the structure of our bracket. So we would have to dip into their game and we could do it one of two ways. We could either, uh, typically what we would do is we would have the analyst desk talk about the game that was going on, not necessarily do a play by play, but just kind of do an overview of what's going on and what the ramifications are. Uh, but there was one particular time where, again, it's a double, uh, usually a double elimination bracket, and we had we were waiting for a game to finish, and the game finished the way we didn't want it to, and it completely reset the bracket. So we were looking at an hour 15 before we our show got back on the air. So we needed the ability to join into their broadcast to fill that time. Um, doing that in analog is totally possible, but really, really copper heavy. It, it would be a ton of DT, a ton of different resources. Dante made it really simple for everyone to share everything. Typically, the, uh, the game sounds were hosted in the TV truck. You typically have an observer um, who's kind of a sub-director. 
the observer cuts to whoever's POV is important at any particular time. So you have a director for the show, and then you have a sub-director who is the observer who is uh, directing the game coverage. That's all of the cuts that you saw in the video. Um, so all of those streams originate from the truck. And so instead of having to DA the different signals and pass them out in separate DTs, I could feed them out on a Dante stream and every mixer that would have to see those feeds could see them. And so this might be a good point uh, to actually show you a schematic of, and I wanna stress this is very, very simplified uh, of the type of hardware and configuration that we were using. So in this, I've kind of broken it out into five different zones. Uh, so the first zone in the upper left, you have an analyst desk. You have uh, five headsets that can work off of PoE. So for the most part, you plug a headset in, you have a PoE out and that's your data and your IFB and everything is all on that single cat five. Um, we also have a caster desk, which most of the time there's two people casting. We like to have a backup just in case. So there's three headsets there doing the exact same thing. In the upper right, we kind of have our miscellaneous configuration. So uh, you see there, you, you know, you have a Yamaha IO box, you've got uh, an Axion box, you've got Avios, which we used for like the single speaker feeds, things like that. Uh, these might be all over the place. You've got a you've got a rig like that for back of house. You might have a rig over at you know what we call the birthday cake in a different game mode. You might have a rig for that over in uh, the practice area or the yeah, the, any of many different places, the entryway. Um, so that's a typical, uh, you know, a typical set of hardware for those ancillary locations. Then you've got the front of house stack. So you've got John's front of house mixer. He has his own playback devices so he can play sponsor reads, his own music if for some reason he can't talk to me, um, his own Axiant setup so that he can, you know, get different microphones. Sometimes we used them as range extenders so we could get a different part of the venue that was physically difficult to get signal from. And then you have the TV truck, uh, which was kind of where the the, the heaviest traffic laid. And you, you see there, so, you know, we had some IO boxes just for random sources, depending on how the, the building layout was. Um, we had the RTS, uh, which for the early part uh, was all analog ins and outs. Uh, Pete will talk about that a little later, but we ended up migrating to Omnio and putting that on the Dante network because that simplified a lot of our configurations. Uh, we'll get into that in a little bit. Um, then you had uh, the boxes in the middle, one's a Yamaha, one's a Rednet. Those are MADI converters because the uh, TV trucks are just not built for Dante. I would love it if more TV trucks were built for Dante, but even the ones that have a little bit of Dante don't really have a robust Dante setup, uh, a robust networking configuration, something that's very flexible. Typically you get an, I, you know, an IT guy at the TV truck company that set it up once and says, don't ever touch it because then I'm gonna have to rechange the settings again. So that's something that TV trucks are progressing to, but what all of the trucks nowadays have is Matty. So the easiest way for us to integrate the TV truck to the rest of the world was to use a Dante to Matty converter, and that's what directly integrated to my CalRec console. And on top of that, you see I had four separate laptops running in my room. Um, we had what we called a Stinger's laptop, which is uh, the, the music you play at the peak moment when someone wins the game or when we come back for a commercial, some very specific music. We have a 24 hour music bed that just runs all the time. That's generic music that we can dip in and out of if there's a lull in the action or technical difficulty, commercial break, whatever. We have a backup laptop to that. And then we have a separate laptop specifically for the Dante routing in case we have to get to something in a hurry and we don't wanna take you know resources away from the, any of the other computers. And so here's a little bit of uh, the Dante setup. This is one of the captures that uh, John happened to have of one of our larger shows. Um, the challenges with the show like we were doing is first of all, it's a ton of packets. Not only is it a ton of sources in and out, a ton of destinations to send it to, it's a ton of packets. Um, John and I talked about this a lot, but John's desire was to run the hardware at the lowest possible latency. Um, which is totally understandable because especially when you're dealing with front of house element, the number of places you have to pass it to all add latency. The latency all goes into the front of house system. The worse the latency is, the worse it sounds back to myself because of the more echo there is. So any of the chipsets that were able to run quarter millisecond, we ran at quarter millisecond. Now, when you think about it, do the math, that's 4,000 packets per second per stream. 
So a, an individual Dante stream can have up to four audio sources going in one direction to the same device at the same time. You're talking tens and tens and tens of thousands of packets all going you know, out one direction at the same time, plus receiving the same amount of packets back. It's a ton of packets. Uh, it's also a very non-linear data workflow because you have audio. So let's let's take the announcers, for example. The announcers headsets uh, don't actually go both to the front of house and to me. They have to come to me first because I have to mix it. So it comes from the announcers all the way to the TV truck. Then I have to reinsert it into the Dante stream back out to John. So the, the audio tends to hit multiple things uh, in the chain. And there's a lot of things in that chain, especially considering the IFBs, because the IFBs have to go from the headset into my board through to the, either the Dante or whatever analog setup Pete happened to have on that yeah, show, then back out yeah. to them. Yeah, yeah. There's there's a lot of different uh, a lot of pieces in the chain. So the lower latency you could get, the better. Um, because of that, is then you have the next bullet point. There's a ton of cross connected sources. Everything talks to everything. And actually, we ran into a lot of situations where. Uh, with the particular announce boxes we had, there's chipset limitations as to how many devices you can talk to and listen from at the same time. Yeah, so we had to redesign our network a little bit around that. You want to talk about that, John? Yeah. The, well, the Dante nomenclature for those things are flows, and the flow from a device is its capability and how many places it can address a single output going to multiple places. It's dependent on the chipset. And some of these smaller devices have a, a lesser chip involved in the like the, the main console. Uh, so there's the limit to how many places you could possibly send what they call the unicast broadcast, which is the the, the basic out of the box turn of signals to travel on Dante. There's another mode that can be used, which is a multicast, which allows one broadcast to be picked up at any box. But you have to manage that very carefully because when you start creating a lot of multi flows that's a huge number of records that go everywhere at once and it's it, it would be okay except that there are devices on the network which are connected at one gigahertz uh you know uh, network connections and some of the devices are only at 100. it's very easy to overpower those with way too much debt. so if you get into a situation where you need to have flows going to too many places and uh, there's not enough there's not enough connectivity at the, some of these lower end boxes to John, do it you'd have to John. do multicast John, turn off your camera. Maybe your audio will be a little bit better without, uh, with a little less bandwidth from your camera. Yeah, I think okay. the thunderstorm's starting to get to you. Um, and just to, yeah, just to follow up on on what John was saying, um, you know, it, everything is very dependent on the hardware we pick, and so some of the chipsets are very limited as to the number of flows you can have on a network. So there were certain things that I had to pass into the TV truck through the uh, uh, Maddie converter specifically to make sure that we didn't overrun the number of flows. So I might take that Maddie stream and feed uh, something into the intercom via Maddie, just so that it didn't violate the number of Dante flows, uh, you know, because Maddie obviously doesn't add another hop to Dante. And so there was a lot of different reconfiguration that we had to do based on that. Um, and we'll actually get into a little bit of that when I get to the network schematic, which is coming up uh, next. Um, so tons of hops uh, is the next bullet point. And this, uh, more with the uh, the old design before we redesigned, um, the building layout really determined most of how things were wired. And we had switches connected to other switches that sometimes, based on how the venue was, you know, if you're 50 feet from one stage to another, maybe you hop from one stage to the other before you come back, you know, all the way back to the back of house. Um, there was a lot of physical things that determined how the hops worked, which especially when you're running lower latency becomes a major problem. And the last thing uh, that was a challenge for this particular show, uh, when I came on, uh, it was something that they had expanded upon uh, from a smaller setup. So they were still using uh, smaller switches, consumer grade switches uh, that theoretically should have been able to handle the traffic. Uh, but basically the problem we had was, uh, you know, Dante will tell you, you know, a gigabit network is all you need. It'll do everything you needed to do. But what they don't tell you is that a lot of times you don't have a throughput problem. You have a packets per second problem. And that's what we tended to have on this show. Um, we also had an issue uh, with uh, zero conf, which is the auto IP addressing, uh, which we'll talk about in just a little bit. Um, but I'll give you an idea in this next slide uh, how things were laid out. So here's the same exact diagram that we had before. 
Um, and here you have the, uh, these are the actual Netgear switches. These are actually bigger than some of them. Some of them are the same size. Uh, the actual Netgear switches that we used in the configuration. So you've got the analyst desk, the caster desk, you know, some of the ancillary uh, positions. Usually each of them had their own switch. And if the analyst desk is relatively close to the caster desk, maybe you chain one to the other before it comes back to back a house. Um, you know, maybe you have the ability to run direct, depends on if you have media converters, all of this other stuff. So the number of hops that you had between devices could change drastically. So I, I'll add on all of the traces as to how these things work. Now, everything you see in red is Dante primary and everything you see in blue is Dante secondary. So here you can kind of see how things might possibly splay out. And if you trace your lines from the caster desk to the front of house setup, you can see you, depending on how the building is, you can add quite a bit of hops and create quite a bit of problems. You know, if anything in that chain goes down, you lose everything past that branch of the network. And it's, it's you know, kind of a big problem. Uh, there's also some niceties that we didn't have with these old switches, which uh, like, for example, all of the boxes are PoE capable. Well, obviously the net gears weren't PoE. So Chris had to go under the desk and put a bunch of wall warts in, and, you know, we had to get power strips and run them up into the, into the announce boxes. And, you know, a lot of times we were power constrained or space constrained, or, you know, of course, or an announcer might put his feet up. Exactly. That's exactly what I was about to say. Someone might accidentally kick the power switch that we had to put in. Right. So that created a bunch of its own problems as well. So there were a lot of different challenges. You know, uh, there's no redundancy in those smaller boxes. That's just a, a limitation of the particular chipset. So it's not like you can run the blue network, the, the backup network on any of those boxes. So if your switch goes down, you lose all of those pieces. Uh, which, you know, would happen anyways. But if you lose the link from your analyst desk to your truck, you lose everybody. You lose all of your announcers at the same time. Obviously, that's not ideal. Um, so in this particular configuration, there were a ton of problems, and that's what we're going to focus on next. Um, so the throughput versus packets per second is what we talked about. Dante, when in all of their training materials and their level three cert, they don't really go into the packets per second limitations of your switches because they don't really know what they are. So when you're using lighter fabric, you can run into these ghost issues. And so we would have problems where uh, the entire show would get built. And then on a setup day, we'd have to go in and change a Dante route and either the route wouldn't take or it would be unstable or it would cause other routes to fail. And it was kind of a game of Jenga trying to make it all work, basically because the switches were at their absolute top maximum. And when it tried to send another route, it would choke the rest of the network. It couldn't keep up with the packets per second. And that's where you had your issues. So once we got into show mode, you know, typically we'd have, uh, let's say three set days to, to set everything up. When you got to Friday, which was your first show day, it was basically hands off the Dante network unless it was absolutely critical. So you didn't run into any problems. Uh, there was also yeah, we, we the run distance. One of the personalities of Dante in particular, it's an incredibly stable uh, system for getting audio around. When it's on, it just stays on. You can throw almost anything at it. Once you start trying to make changes in configuration, routing things, uh, it becomes much less stable. It doesn't like to be altered, although it is designed to be something that is dynamically changeable. It's it's it does its best work when it just stays on, and it will stay on for you. It will stay on like a truck going. I mean, it just doesn't stop. But when you start trying to change configurations, it is not. Uh, that's not a good thing to do in the middle of a show. We certainly found that out. Yes. And that's and you know that's as, as well designed as the Dante network is. There are those limitations, and you just don't want to you don't want to run into that on a show day. You know, God forbid something goes down. Um, the lack of fiber that we had was a problem. There were certain uh, venues and certain places where we could use media converters to jump back and forth, but a lot of times we had to rethink our runs because when you're you know running a Cat six wire next to an entire video wall. The video wall is going to win. You know, the, you have really timing sensitive, low latency packets, and they're just not going to win out if you're, you know, putting a couple of milliamps next to a thousand amps. It's just that's just how electronics work. So we and had to be really real careful. Of, we have, there's no shortage of sources that can cause problems, whether it's something as simple as feeder cable on the floor or much more complex data intensive things like cable runs involving the backs of video walls. 
there's there's a, an enormous amount of stuff that gets in the way. We we had to reroute analog copper uh, lots of times. Many times we were able mm -hmm. to trace down problems that would come and go based on what we finally figured out was EMI interference in the cable because of proximity to other EMI sources. Absolutely. Um, we were also limited with our the the amount of distance we could run. You know, let's say we only had a Cat five wire left and not a Cat six wire. You know, that creates its own problems. And now you can only go a certain amount of feet, so maybe you have to put a switch in between, which adds another hop. You know, there was all of those other issues as well. Um, and then there was zero conf, and this is one of my favorite stories. Um, so we very intentionally run a separate IT infrastructure from the rest of the world. Um, we've tried integrating our audio network or pieces of it onto the IT staff's network. Uh, more often than not, it causes problems. Uh, based on their configuration, how they're doing spanning tree, there's a whole bunch of deep level networking stuff I could get into about why it doesn't work. Suffice it to say, their network is not really built to do our type of data. And a lot of times we would plug in to their network, it would create traffic loops and basically take down their network. We had an event where that happened, where it just started crashing switches all the way around the venue as each switch would fail under our traffic load because of the traffic loop. But running in zero conf, which is how we started, which is auto IP for those who aren't familiar with the networking term zero conf, um, that's a mode where you don't have a DHCP server, you just plug in the device, it doesn't see a DHCP server, it assigns itself a random uh, address in a certain address space, and all of the devices just talk and listen and see each other. That's great when it works. And if you've got a small isolated network and a couple devices, you can plug things into a switch and not have to think about it. And it's great and it's wonderful and it works. When you have a situation like ours, it's not always ideal. And this is a very specific situation that happened to us on a set day. Um, underneath the stage, uh, I believe it was the analyst desk, uh, we have both an IT switch and one of our switches. And one of the uh, talent were trying to plug in a laptop and thought that they were plugging the IT switch into their laptop. And in reality, what they did was they plugged the IT network into our network. The result was the IT network addressed every box on our entire network uh, outside of the IP span that it was supposed to be in. Um, there's no going back from that. So we lost everything on the network. Um, eventually it came back and only certain pieces were on because only certain pieces took the DHCP information. So we decided, okay, well, let's just reboot the devices. They'll go back to zero conf and everything will work. So we pulled the wire out, we unplugged the, uh, the devices and nothing went back. And it's because now the network switches have the MAC address and an IP address that isn't valid anymore. So the network switches have no idea where to send the packets. So we not only had to go back again and unplug every individual device off the network, but the entire infrastructure too, all of the Netgear switches and everything else. Luckily it happened on a set day because if it would have happened on a show day, we would have been down for about 20 minutes while we A, troubleshot the problem and B, had to solve the problem. So zero conf is a great thing until it doesn't work and then it becomes an absolute nightmare. And I'm just really, really happy that it didn't happen during a show day. Yeah, it just sits there waiting to be informed. Did you end up using static IP for everything? Uh, well, so there was a problem with that as well. Um, so we decided, yes, that's the easiest solution. So let's do everything static IP. Um, but the Yamaha boxes in particular had a problem. Um, Yamaha, when they built their network stack, uh, has a different uh, stack for the Dante hardware and a different stack for the GUI. So it is actually very easy to get the IPs of the two completely out of sync, but the actual physical wire plugs into the Dante side. So if the, the Dante part of the network doesn't have the right address span, the back end doesn't see it, but just the same, you can get the Dante on and you haven't assigned the Yamaha address properly, then you still can't get to the Yamaha side. So you're and there's the, the, output, the Dante output and the and the control was on the same jack of the Yamaha. Yes, it's all on the it it's is, all on the Dante, same physical right, cat five Dante with separate stacks. Yeah, Dante itself doesn't uh, have any 
It doesn't have any ability to talk uh, between devices. It, it just passes audio. There's no control information, so there's no control over head amps. That's done by this secondary area in the console, which talks across the same physical Ethernet jack. But uh, those addresses need to be able to match up properly. Otherwise, the you can't you know you're at a console, you can't control the head amps in your in your I/O here. You can't you know change mic levels. Absolutely. And and Yamaha built it so that you have dip switches on the back, and so you can tell the Yamaha network stack, okay, I want it to be forced to zero conf, or okay, I want it to be forced to um, DHCP, or I want it to be forced to a static IP. But there's software limitations to where if I tell the device that I want it to be a static IP, I have to be a, I have to have preset the Dante address to something in that address span so I can still talk to the second network stack and tell it what IP to be. Otherwise, the two get out of sync and you can't talk. And we ended up spending two entire days trying to make it all work through only static IPs and just decided it wasn't worth it. So what we ended up doing was we created a hybrid. We static IP'd every Dante stack in the entire building. So that way, no matter what, if something went bad, we were still passing audio. So you still had the most critical element of the network. And then we told all of the Yamaha network stacks to be DHCP, and then we put a DHCP server on the network. We put those in the same address span, or I'm sorry, the same subnet, and that way uh, we everything could talk to one another. The Yamaha stack was happy. We didn't have to worry about when we set certain IPs and when certain other things came up. And more importantly, if something were to happen, a DHCP server were to get plugged into the network, the audio would still pass, because to us that was the most important thing, and that's how we ended up redesigning the network, which happens to be our next slide. Um, <laughs> what the, what the DHCP server were you using? Just an Apple uh, access point? I actually just bought an off-the-shelf Raspberry Pi and just oh, okay. started the DHCP server on that. There I built go. an image that uh, uh, would fail clean, so it was a read-only image, uh, because really it didn't matter what the addresses were as long as they were in the same span. It didn't matter if the the Raspberry Pi rebooted and it forgot what the addresses were as long as they were in the right address span that all that's all that mattered to us and so we just re the entire network fix for forty thousand dollars worth of audio hardware was a thirty five dollar Raspberry Pi so good on you guys for that um so the network redesign uh I I had thought about all of these different problems that we were encountering and uh, I basically had to redesign the network from the ground up to to satisfy all of the different elements and make it as fail safe as we possibly could. Um, because John wanted to run at quarter millisecond latency, I wanted to, to design a star that never, uh, no matter where you were on a network, every device was three hops away so that way it didn't violate the quarter millisecond spec of Dante. Uh, we wanted everything to run on bi-directional fiber, so it was a single fiber for a single switch um and there's some exceptions to that but it eliminates the the cat six problem you don't have to worry about if a cat six wire is bad you just got to worry about if the fiber's clean which is easy enough to detect uh you don't have to worry about media converters if those power supplies are working you don't have to worry about run lengths all of that sort of stuff it eliminates a lot of problems um but we also very specifically wanted redundancy everywhere and that becomes a problem because as you remember a lot of those devices don't have redundancy built into them. The announce boxes only work on the red network. They don't have a backup. You know, they don't work on Dante redundant. We wanted redundancy no even in those devices. So that's how we had to design this network to basically make it a little more fail safe for crushed fiber scenarios and stuff like that. Um, and we had a couple different options. Uh, we had uh, the VLAN option, which is how I had originally designed the network. Um, we were gonna run both of them on separate VLANs and have the same switch uh, pass one particular VLAN out one fiber and another out another, just so we had optical redundancy and all of those sorts of things. We ended up just deciding on having separate switches. Um, so that way, if a switch goes down and there's redundant Dante gear, it still talks no matter what. Luckily, we never had that problem, but it was just an extra layer of redundancy that we ended up building into the network. Uh, for the devices that didn't have redundancy, all the announce boxes, for example, which is one of the most important pieces of your show, those announcers, because when they don't, when they can't talk, a lot of people get upset about that. Uh, we had to come up with a way to make that redundant. And what we ended up coming up with was uh, LACP, which is Link Aggregation Control Protocol. Uh, link aggregation is, uh, for those of you that don't know the deep level networking, uh, you run a single network off of two different network fabrics. So let's say I have a single fiber connecting one switch to another switch. 
if I can put the switch into LACP mode and run two fibers, uh, it will use the bandwidth of both. So it effectively doubles your network bandwidth. And more importantly, if one of them were to break, the network automatically starts sending all of the packets to the working link. And that's how we created the network uh, redundancy. Uh, in Dante world, we were a little worried about how uh, the Dante protocol would handle the packet drops. It turned out to handle it flawlessly. You would see in the network logs, you'd lose maybe six packets or something small like that, depending on what the latency setting was. Um, but more importantly, the show would go on. The announcers could keep talking. You might hear a, you know, a couple millisecond glitch, but everything still worked. And that was the most important thing for us is how do you get through that fire drill scenario? Um, and in doing that, we were able to make it so that the switches that were carrying non-redundant um, data had two fibers, and the two switches that were carrying the redundant data had two fibers. So when we were designing the network, if there was audio there, we just needed two fibers. So we didn't have to constantly be asked by uh, by Mark, you know, is there is this uh, one fiber, two fibers in this particular location? It's just nope, give us two everywhere we went. So it simplified the design of the network as well. Um, and we chose, uh, I chose very specifically D-Link gear because D-Link is my favorite network hardware for cheap but fast. Um, I have a bunch of D-Link gear myself and I can tell you that the D-Link gear that you see there, uh, the top one being uh, the, the separate PoE switch that we put under the desks, the middle being the SFP switch, which is where all of the fiber went in and out, and the bottom being one of the bigger switches. Uh, they all worked flawlessly and were really, really cheap in the process. Well, I say cheap because I don't have to have the budgets. Mark does that. So, But cheap compared to what I could have billed Mark for, it was cheap. Um, so let me show you what that redesign looked like. Um, so here you have the same general concept. Uh, you've got the new switches in. You've got reds in certain parts. You've got red and blues in other parts, depending on what the chipset is and how it functions. Um, and let me redraw the lines just the same. You'll notice a couple thick lines. Uh, we decided that for the heaviest traffic areas, uh, we were gonna run 10 gig. Uh, it is 100% not necessary in Dante world, and Dante will tell you over and over, you don't need to run 10 gig. Because of the amount of traffic we were passing, and really not so much the throughput, but again, the packets per second, we wanted as many packets per second as possible and as much tolerance with dirty signal as we could. So there was a 10 gig link uh, to the front of house. We just did it to the primary. We didn't do it to the redundant because we didn't want to go crazy. And we did 10 gig uh, direct connect from the fiber switches to the truck switch because that was where the majority of the data on the network passed. So yeah, so if you, uh, if you trace the lines in this particular one, it doesn't matter where you are on the network, everything is three hops away. If you're an analyst headset trying to get to front of house, you go out of your switch into the fiber switch, doesn't need to go to me, goes right out to the fiber to front of house and it goes right to his console. Nice, simple, easy, three switches involved, never more than that. And also we added one extra element. There's two little green lines down in the bottom corner that you can see. Um, the old network, uh, the old way that we did the network, there wasn't a sync generator. There wasn't a true sync generator. We would typically set a device uh, that had a better chipset to be the master uh, for the word clock for everything in the world. Well, TV trucks happen to have reference generators. So they've got, you know, $13,000 sync clocks. Why not use that? Why not use the most reliable clock in the building to do your entire network? That also made it easier when it came to syncing the MADI stream in the truck and everything else. So we ended up adding the sync from the sync generators directly. We would take an output and put it in word clock and feed it directly into the MADI converter and make the MADI converter the master clock for the entire Dante world, which had the advantage of syncing everything to the TV truck, uh, which made all of the synchronization real easy and, and work well. Hi, John, welcome back. Um, so this was uh, the redesign and it ended up working really, really well. We were able to beat up on the network and do some routes in show and it was as reliable as it could be. We'd leave everything running overnight and the only things that complained about latency hits were the Windows laptops, you know, the things that were bad chip or, you know, cheap chipsets or, you know, let's say a Windows update runs in the background or an antivirus screws up the stream. So with this system making changes live during the show didn't upset the Dante system and it just kept on ticking. 
No, as so long as you made the correct change. change. Yeah. We yeah. were trying, we never tried to never really make a major change. But once in a while, there was something that did have to get changed. Yeah. 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 You try to, you try to be as hands off as you can, but every now and then you got to make something. Um, is there anything else you guys want to talk about uh, as far as the, uh, the physical Dante infrastructure goes? Anything anyone else wants to bring up? Well, the only thing is that uh, this terrific net network you built out also allowed me to run my Atom Rio panels out to front of house over the network through a VLAN that you built up and it used a regular Atom Rio thing. And I had a six way box out at front of house and plugged it in and had all my uh, KP32s out there without even uh, running a cable. It was terrific. Yeah, we, we had the extra overhead to build extra VLANs to keep that data completely isolated from our Dante data. Uh, but Pete brings about an interesting point. Um, in the original design, even though I, I drew them the same just so it's easier for everyone to understand, um, we actually couldn't use the Omnio card in the truck because the switches by the TV truck were so maxed out with data that when we started trying to integrate the IFBs back and forth and tried to make everything work, it was overloading the switch and we had all sorts of instability problems. The device would drop off the network, it would stutter, there was, there was a lot of different problems. So we were so at the threshold of what the switches could handle that we just, it, it was so unreliable that we couldn't use it. So Pete used to have to run DTs out of, out of the back of the truck and over well, to his I, gear. I, I did that because that that's that was there it was in the truck but it was a, a pain in the neck because you know at, at, for every 12 pair dt 10 mo sort of work and the rest don't work but in the last two or three shows uh i went to a maddie to analog converter box and got 32 ports of uh, maddie out of directly out of the atom and then just plugged it into my uh double free speak main uh, free speak standalone stations 20 20 ports into those two stations for a total of 25 bell packs and it was it worked everything worked right away it was great the uh the the rest of the intercom system the rest of the comm system was basically the tv truck duplicated outside the tv truck so we did did that pretty much all with Rio as well. We put uh, a couple of uh, Rio switches out outside, and uh, put. Uh, I, I think uh, you mean Arvon. There. I think you mean Arvon. Arvon. I, I mean, Arvon. Arvon. You're right. You're Rio right. Arvon. is Arvon. Arvon. Rio. Well, Arvon is the com. Correct. Yeah. So the, the Arv the Arvon panels from the Atom, and it worked great. It was no mm -hmm. no problem whatsoever. And we were actually running certain key panels on Arvon and certain key panels on uh, Omnio, um, because it, it, for those who aren't familiar with the Omnio card, yeah. um, the Omnio card does, it, it actually is a Dante card. It's funny. There was years and years where RTS absolutely refused to admit that they were running Dante, you know, because of course, in order to send the KP32 data, like John was saying, Dante doesn't pass control data. It just passes audio. It doesn't do device control. Yep. It doesn't do anything else. It just passes audio. So they didn't want to tell you that it was a Dante card because if you started trying to route signals using Dante, then the key panels would stop working and you could overwrite certain routes and you would have all sorts yeah, of yeah. problems because yeah, of that. You, yeah, you, Except, can't, you, you can't do Dante routing to your panels. You have to do the regular Atom programming and those routes do not show up in Dante controller. You can't see them. You just have to trust that they're there. But you can do regular garden variety Dante routing to the Omnio unit as long as it's not control panels for panels. Yes, and you can do both of those uh, on the same card. So we had certain yeah. uh, quote unquote Dante ins and outs dedicated to key panels which the RTS took care of and it did its route. So that way it sent its side channel data and all of the other stuff. But then we had other Dante ports that were actually on the Dante network. So we could route, right. let's say like the audio to the IFBs or we could route uh, the, the right, buddy right. chat talk arounds to the second talk back of the box. The, the, the talk arounds, interestingly enough, is, a, is a, a channel for each set of players just to talk amongst themselves. And it wasn't on all the time. They could push a button and talk to it. But but the uh, uh, the way we did it is we just took went to the end of the Omnio card, 
and just took those Dante feeds and just put them in separate little party lines down there for each different group. And that's all it was. No other yeah, that's what I was needed. talking about. Yeah, that's what I was talking about, trying to keep the announcers on their headsets. Uh, that's how we did it. We made them a separate talkback button that went directly to the Omnio card into a PL all by themselves so that they could talk amongst themselves. They wouldn't have to take their right. headsets off to talk to each other. And that's how we kept everyone happy. And it worked really, right. really well. We burned a bunch of IOs at the end of the card, but we ended up having them and it worked really great. There were a couple of questions of de talking to the announcers. And uh, basically, they were regular IFB feeds from the director. So the director could talk to them individually or as a group and it ducked the audio on their headset by a certain amount, sometimes a lot, sometimes a little, depending on whether they were a caster or an analyst. And then the, the each of the different announcers out there could talk back to the director. That's not ducked or anything, that's just a direct talk back to the director on his listen key. And, that and then the third thing in there were their private little channel. Yeah, and th and that's actually something where uh, I brought some of sports to the to the video game world. Uh, you know, in sports, we're used to interrupt and non-interrupt. You know, that's just how everyone works. You have the IFB only come in one ear, and you have the program continue in the other, so your announcers can keep talking. Well, we had a lot of issues uh, with certain personnel. So with these casters and uh, analysts, uh, they rotate constantly. You know, there's a bunch of different guys that come in. Maybe two casters work this one game. You know, maybe one analyst isn't at the desk for this. They bring in someone else. There's a lot of bodies that rotate around. And because of that, certain people were comfortable with IFB, and so they could keep talking through a director queuing them. Certain people would absolutely lock up. So, you know, we experimented with like changing how much the dim settings were. So how much the program came out of their ears so it didn't lock them up. And eventually, uh, I, I just started splitting into interrupt and non-interrupt. And because of the Dante infrastructure, it was relatively easy to do. And it ended up being a scenario that everyone really enjoyed. You know, everyone had the ability to control yeah. the volumes uh, to their own liking and still be able to hear themselves talk or someone else talk to them while the director was talking and it worked really, really well. So that's one of those sports inventions that worked really well for them once they learned how to use it. Any uh, other questions, Pete? The, the question, how much did you have to bridge from multicast back down to unicast to transcode from Dante to something like Dante? Were there any problems that, with clock sync and how did you ever overcome that? That would That's actually a great question. So. One of the issues we had was with, again, the smaller chipsets. So let's say we had to send uh, from the analyst headset, you know, let's say John needs a copy of that in his board direct in case someone has to talk uh, off air, you know, or off of my air, I guess I should say. Um, then we have to send uh, a copy of that into uh, my console. So that goes down to the bottom of your drawing into the MADI converter. Uh, but then uh, everyone likes to do key listens on their IFB. So what Pete would you know, typically set up and what you do in the entertainment world is every microphone that you have an IFB for on the bottom side of the switch, on the top side of the switch, you have the microphone listen that's pre-fade so that anyone in the truck can hear any talent pre-fade and they can have a conversation offline. Um, that's three streams to three different devices and it violates the chipset's maximums. So we couldn't do it that way. So there were scenarios early on before we redesigned where we would take the audio, send it to uh, the uh, MADI converters. The MADI converter would send it directly into my console MADI, and then I would send it pre-fade via MADI into the intercom as opposed to going through Dante again. So that way in the Dante world, it's still only a single destination. Uh, but to the rest of the world, you know, to, to the equipment, they're still getting the signal and everything works. But there were synchronization problems with that. Um, and Parker, who was the engineer on the truck, which if Parker's watching, Parker did a fantastic job engineering that TV truck, doing the integration to all of the extra road cases, the IT infrastructure necessary, not just for our stuff, but for all of the uh, the, the hard drives, the the archival, the you know working with IT to get all of that stuff working, he did a stellar, all the game stellar job. And their IT in the truck at the same time as well. Yes, it, he did it. He did an outstanding job uh, with all of that. Parker and I uh, had to spend a lot of time working on the synchronization for the different cards 
because let's say you could get the the Maddie uh, or let's say you could get the Dante in sync because it would it eventually was on the same word clock as everything else. The Maddie card might not be locked to the same sync, so then you'd get stuttering issues, dropout stuff like that. Uh, which is why you have the drawing that's in front of you with the green lines because the advantage now is the same word clock that is doing the Dante clock is now also doing the truck clock, which means that the Maddie clock is actually exactly timed the same. So that's why we use the truck master clock for the entire world because it cleaned up all of those synchronization problems. But yes, it is absolutely a problem and something that you might run into if you don't do it this way. And the reason you use the truck clock rather than getting a, a let's say a, a studio technologies clock was it was right there right it was already there you know it's exactly. like i said you've got a thirteen thousand dollar oscillating crystal why wouldn't you use it to run everything you know yep. Yep. makes perfect sense uh, there are a couple of questions about um separating pa from player mics and i know we're going to talk about player mics and player sound next so that'll answer their questions yes absolutely and so let's actually go to that um so we've talked about the network infrastructure so now we talk about the sounds um there's a lot of different layers to this it is it is absolutely reinventing the wheel every time for every game and every scenario um, and the first bullet point right there, game sounds, 5.1 versus stereo. This is the first thing we ran into. Uh, there are certain games out there uh, that only work in stereo. You know, a couple of the ones off the top of my head, you know, Halo is a game that is only in stereo. Um, there's uh, Gears of War, which is only in stereo. There's a lot of things that only run in stereo. Um, you know, some of the id software runs only in stereo. Um, there are some uh, that run in beautiful 5.1 and 7.1 and all sorts of other expanded formats. Uh, Call of Duty is the best video game sound out there that I have ever heard in my life, bar none, and kudos to them for their sound design. Um, but that also creates its own problem. So originally, when we came on, uh, we were doing a stereo game. And so we designed the entire setup around the stereo game and everything, you know, we, we built it up and made it sound good and everything worked. And then we started doing a 5-1 game and things sounded vastly different and we had to figure out why. And it was because the infrastructure, the way that we had it built was only taking the first two channels, the quote unquote stereo channels, which in reality in the surround world are front left and front right. So you were missing a ton of the image of the sound. So let's say, you know, you're in a first person shooter and, you know, there's a bomb that goes off in the background in the distance or, you know, there's some effect. Uh, a lot of the games have uh, certain uh, like call outs, you know, players say stuff to other things in the game, you know, certain vocal tracks that come in the game, uh, footsteps behind you from your teammates. All of that stuff was just hard missing, just nowhere to be found. And it's because the uh, the video game systems didn't down mix properly when it was attached to the conversion gear that we were using to get the signals into the TV truck. So that's so, the problem. Right, exactly. So, you know, in in your regular setup, you know, your computer knows that if you're going to spit it out on an analog jack to your two speakers, it just does it. But in our world, in the broadcast world, the converters that we use are pulling everything out of the stream and we couldn't find any simple way either in the game software or even in the console software to force the console to down mix to stereo there are options for that especially depending on the type of console most of them uh in the surround games just flat out ignored the settings we we had incredibly frustrating problems with that so what we ended up doing is because i was on a large enough console i happened to have a, uh, an apollo in front of me we pulled all of the 5.1 games in in 5.1 and let the console do a proper down mix of the content. And, and how were you actually you know, as, getting that out of the game? So uh, out of the, the game contained 7.1 uh, data. 
So we basically just pulled the individual stems for 5.1, and actually we had some complications with that as well. The way that the game outputted the sound to our converters had two of the channels swap. The center and the LFE channels were actually backwards, and so we had to figure that out as well because, again, it's like, oh, this doesn't sound right. What's, what's going on? And so you have to get into each individual stem to figure that out. Um, but so we took the five one stems that were being fed through the video signal uh, into the converter into the TV truck, picked out the right ones, sent them into a fader and down mixed it. And anyone who walked in my room could tell you instantaneously the difference in the detail and levels of sound. Uh, it was night and day different. And so it brought a completely different sound image uh, to, to the end user at home, it was noticeable on the stream. Like a lot of this stuff is just, oh, okay, I'm an audio guy. Yes, I can hear all of those things. No, it was, it really was noticeable. The difference in the, the nuances and the birds chirping in the background, the footsteps behind you, it really, really made a difference. I thought those were real birds in your control room. Uh, I, you know, I might have a sound effect bank, you know, I mean, maybe I've got some hotkeys. Yeah. You don't know. Exactly. I, I can't give away all my secrets. Right. Exactly. Um, so controlling the NAT sounds, uh, not only in the game, but in the stadium were also a big problem. Uh, you know, the the esports e world is very dynamic, uh, especially in its crowd. You know, we talked earlier how certain teams have large traveling uh, groups of fans and certain teams don't. You know, maybe you've got a game at nine in the morning, the first game of the day, and no one's woken up yet. We had a situation where one of the teams didn't wake up in time to be on the main stage. Um, stuff like that happens. So we had a lot of problems, uh, not only inserting the crowd noise into the, the air product, but also into the IFBs. Uh, a lot of the, uh, the casters uh, needed to hear the crowd to feed off of them just the same there's a lot of i would call them soccer like chants um you know people saying certain things back and forth taunting stuff like that uh the announcers wanted to react to that but how do you put enough of that sound in their ear for them to recognize it but not make it an echo chamber in their own ears because that's a lot of slapback it was a real fine balancing act and we had certain announcers that wanted a ton of gnats certain announcers that didn't and you just kind of you fought it with every single broadcast you did in every single game you did with every single set of announcers and you just you tried to make it as easy as you could to accommodate everybody and you know as you heard in the, the sample clip we played earlier it you know sometimes it works out and it works really really well and it sounds great john did you uh, use any kind of immersive audio things in the pa well i you know, once we were dealing with the surround, uh, uh, fold folding down surround in the truck, um, I certainly was entertaining some ideas for the future, which, um, I mean, I had discussed some of this with other people in the crew, but I had always imagined to try to take the Pink Floyd approach and attempt to do actual surround sound for the listening audience by putting speakers in the back and putting some back channel information into those. We didn't get that far, but that was an interesting idea that immediately popped in my head once I knew that there was actual access to those uh, to those surround stems from the games. Uh, um, so I other remember, than that, there, I didn't do any surround sound in the in the actual venue. I, had I remember to. there was a there was an oh 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 we can do that moment when you all of a sudden realized you could take their mic, the players' mics, and feed it into their cameras that were aiming at them and get an individual feed from every single player instead of the mixed feed from their announce boxes and can, well that can would we get hear... into the history of team chat I, I think we're probably going to talk about that i think we um, want to that's hear actually that's exactly the that. topic that we were about to hit yep. i'm going to tell you a little story about team chat team chat has evolved from a very prehistoric version of trying to capture sound from people playing games to a much more advanced version the very first team chat that I encountered was for a particular game where the, the chat was something that was incorporated into the game, into the actual gaming computers, and worked through the server that all of the players were in a lobby. And their chat was picked up and distributed through a chat app that worked in the lobby. And for us to be able to do a listen-in to hear what the players were saying, I had to run a client on a computer next to my console. It had to be logged into the lobby. I had two iterations of that client running in each team's lobby. 
um, it was notorious for getting kicked out of the lobby or the players having to change lobbies for some reason. And I would have to chase along and try to find the new lobby. And the sound quality was, it was reprehensible. I, I, I think that they were probably, it, it was something that had been designed a long time ago and they were probably using codecs that were very ancient. Um, uh, I, I got this, I got the kind of feeling that it may have been one of the monophonic kind of codecs, like in the very early days of streaming audio and chat audio, you could choose codecs and some of the options would have a little reminder next to it that this is for voice, this one's for music. This was, So the ones that were crafted for voice were uh, really very poor at picking up multi-syllabic sounds and uh, polyphonic sounds. And the submixing that was going on between the players and coming out of this little client app that would run was it's just, it was just dreadful. You could hear tremendous artifacts of all kinds. The clarity between the different players was impossible to discern. And um, the sonic quality overall was just awful. And I took that into a console and I EQ'd it and tried to compress it as much as I could get something useful out of it. And that was our very early team chat. And it was, it was uh, difficult. And I had to constantly watch it to see if it was suddenly kicked out of a lobby somewhere. It was, it was a mess. Next. And actually, while of, we're on this topic, uh, John, we should tell everyone what team chats are, because I'm sure not everyone follows esports and not everyone knows what they are. So well, the team it's, it's chats. The microphones, yeah. All right. The, the microphones, every person in the team who's playing the game, they have a headset on and they, most of the advanced players communicate to each other through this little chat system. And it was decided that a, a cool feature would be to stop listening to announcers calling the game and let uh, the audience at home listen in to what the team players were actually saying to each other, which sounds great, except the way we were capturing it didn't sound so great in the very beginning. Um, and these were these were these were called um, what do they call them? Look-ins, listen-ins. Uh, listen-ins, Astro, Astro Gaming listen-ins were, were our particular sponsor. Uh, and I'm going to uh, I'm going to play a video clip right now, just so anyone who hasn't experienced team chats uh, understands the chaos of one of these things, the particular listen-ins uh, for the teams. And again, forgive and my reach I'll, as I'll I have to reach some, over here. I'll, I'll explain some more iterations of how it developed after. All right, and uh, here comes the clip. Change. Let's go to Astro Gaming Listen in with 100 Thieves. Back up, heady, left heady, our city's looking right. I'm looking right. I gotta relax. Show me, show me. I'm pushing right. Am I getting at the book? Oh, there's two left. Two there. Two left. Two left. Two left. Two left. I got you right. I'll get you right. Focus left. Already right. Already right. Two left. Jump out of the map, Sil. Nice. Two left. Two left. Two left. Four 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 I'm gonna yeah, cut, cut off front. So what's your problem? I'm inside box. Yeah. I'll be your problem. Yeah. I, I, I have to. I have to look pipe. Could be vent. Could be vent. Like, you look my pipe, son. I have pipe. Uh, yeah, I can. I can. Every pipe. Every pipe. Pipe stay. They crash. They crash. Oh, back kitchen, guys. Go. Back kitchen weak. Back kitchen weak. They can be back left. I, I can see it. Like three pipes, guys. They can be back left too. Three pipes. I got one. One HP. Guys, weak. Pipe weak. Weak. Sampy crash. Yeah, there's one more back. Oh, he's front solo. Front solo. No, he already crossed. He crossed. He's going back. Two, 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 two. Two in the back. Where's he? Ampersini. Ampersini. I'll be the Ampersini in the back. Guys, on double. Double, double, double. Nice. Two in the back. Two in the back. Back. Two, two, cubby. Two, five guys in the back. Two, two, cubby. Cubby. Watch out. Come on. There you go. Chaos. Absolute chaos. You can hear that there's uh there's some ambience included in with that. That's not. It sounds like you hear them kind of in a room because they were in a room. In addition to being ported into the, the actual broadcast, we had them delivered into the PA so that the people in the audience could hear it. Uh, that presented its own problems. We had to go to extreme lengths to make sure that there was no possible way that the other team could hear the other team's chat, so the first team's chat. So we incorporated some very serious sound blocking devices, including putting white noise into headsets, covering ear uh, earphones in their ears, to try to ensure that there couldn't be any uh, cheating done by our technical process of trying to bring this ele extra element of the show to people. Um, so that sounded pretty clear. Um, certainly didn't sound like some of the very earliest ones. I, I don't know where we could have gotten a clip for that, but um, the second iteration after doing this built into the server and logging in and pulling sound out of a lobby with whatever software based mixer was created in the, in the, in the program that was running it, um, we actually had little 
audio consoles made by our by the uh, the company that was doing this chat system, and we were able to get a, a single box at the end of the chain of those that each player had with their headset plugged into each one, and one last box had a mixed out. And the early iterations of those boxes, technically they did do some kind of mix, but the hardware was not really set up in a way that gave really usable results. It seemed to work okay from player to player, but when you just took a mixed output, um, there wasn't enough headroom in the audio hardware. The software wasn't designed in a way that allowed you to make adjustments that got really good audio results. That and it was mono. It was mono. You were hearing a mix of mono, the five players. Every single sound was just smashed on top of each other. It came in as, and any of the different sounds from different players' voices or their microphones being a little different position, that was all mixed in. And again, it was just one signal and one EQ had to be used to try to find some happy ground to make it more listenable. Um, and we ran with that for a very long time. Uh, and I'd always enjoyed the idea, even when we had only a limited amount of IO, that if we could get more IO, we could probably try to get into each individual box, get a line out, get it into its own DI, pass it into some sort of IO box behind the stage and process it as a giant group. But that's a lot of extra IO. And, and in the earlier days, we just didn't have that, that much stuff. When the truck came around, we were still using the old, just pulling a mono mix from each team from their mix boxes. Uh, but then we really, we explored the idea of going full scale, going with the idea to actually get an individual ISO output from each player's box, get it into the truck, give each mic its own EQ, its own processing, decide on the balance between them, and even be able to feature changes in volume between which player was being featured in the video broadcast based on the POV camera in front of them. I'm going to ask um, Jason to talk about how those volume changes were decided on and how it was operated, because there's a lot going on when that's happening. But the, the final solution was to actually use those POV cameras, which we discovered, in addition to having a, a, the video output of the camera, had a little tiny um, a breakout cable with a, an audio jack hanging on the edge of it. We were able to take the line out from the little mix, uh, mix boxes sitting on the desks each player into the audio input of their own camera. That would become embedded in the video stream, make its way to the truck. Now, usefully, the video camera showing their face carried their own sound. So for archiving purposes, that was amazing because suddenly there was a really great soundtrack along with what had just been them moving around in front of the screen. All of those things were both archived and available to be put into the, the video program uh, as an individual camera or as a four up in one picture kind of thing. Um, and all of the audio was disembedded at the truck and delivered to the console where Jason was able to treat every microphone separately. And now I want to, uh, in addition to being able to have those as separate sources for panning, volume changes were able to be made both on the level of players and when there was a feature of the player being shown on screen. I would love to hear how you managed to get those volumes to change. How did you track that? Yeah, so there's a lot of special sauce to this. So um, so let's start at the beginning, and this is where I want to bring Chris in. Um, so these particular boxes were the ones we use. They're made by a company called Astro, and they're, they're Astro Mix Amps. Um, so Chris, uh, explain to everyone uh, what they are and what the knobs do. Okay, so the Astro Mix Amps plug into the game console, uh, usually via... I think we did, was it optical or USB? What are the two options? It, it depended on the console. So if, if it was a console, we typically did optical. And then if it was like a computer, we did USB. And then they accept a, a TRRS port on the front of them. And so you can put on a gaming headset with a microphone. And then the, let's see, like the, if you're looking at the Astro on the right, the big knob there will adjust the overall level for uh, your whole mix up or down and then the right knob will adjust between uh, a voice chat and game audio so then the player can adjust between that mix themselves uh, the mix amps have dedicated software to them where you can actually adjust the individual level of the microphone and then you can also adjust what comes out of the each box has an output port that you can specify what audio you would want to go down the output port. So for instance, I think there's an option in there that lets you do the microphone, and then there's also an option in there that lets you do 
the whole chat for everybody. So when we started feeding the POV cameras, individual ISO feeds, we would go into the software and then only extract the microphone audio, send it out the output port, and then it would go into the POV camera where Jason could then disembed it. Yeah, and so just, just so everyone understands how these devices are used in a non-professional setting, uh, there is an output that's a mini output on the back uh, that they call a, I believe, a stream output. And the idea being you can have your teammates, you know, in the same room as you, all of those boxes daisy chained to each other. Um, and then your stream out, if you were to stream on Twitch or some other service, you know, Twitter or whatever, uh, your individual screen, that stream output, you could select what you wanted everyone to hear. So it could be your individual microphone if you, you know, wanted to comment on your own game, you know, boom, headshot, all of that sort of stuff. Um, you could uh, put some of the game audio in if you didn't have another way to insert that and you wanted to put it in. Uh, you could put some of the team chat in if you wanted, you know, some of your other buddies or if you wanted someone else to commentate your game while you're doing it. You had all of those options. So that's uh, that's where when I saw how we were originally doing team chats, uh, so if you look at the picture on the bottom left, that's a typical uh, gaming desk for uh, for really most of the games that we do. Um, all of the boxes would daisy chain uh, one to another to another, and then to get the sounds out, we would put an additional box at the end, set it to output only the team chat and nothing else, no game sounds, no anything else, and then we'd take that out into a DI box, and then that would run on an XLR back to a piece of, you know, usually like TO gear or Rio gear that brought it into the Dante network that we would then pick off. And the result was okay. You know, you have multiple problems here. You have the problem that the hardware is consumer. It's not pro gear. It's just, it's not. Um, then you have the problem that the people who are wearing the headsets are not professional headset wearers. They don't put the microphone right up next to the corner of their mouth. So some of them are way off mic and some of them are right on mic. Um, the, the players themselves have quiet moments and have screaming moments. Uh, you know, the dynamics in the boxes aren't that great because you have to set some type of microphone level and you can do that in the software but it's not easy to do on the fly. And I think it's actually impossible to do when you're in a daisy chain hot. So mm -hmm. there's all of these different sets of limitations. So what we what we got at this point, now obviously leaps and bounds above the side channel software that John was talking about, you know, where you run a completely separate program and that's how your team chat works and you just pick it off of that. Leaps and bounds over that. But what we got as a result was a bunch of people screaming really loud into consumer hardware gear and five microphones being condensed down into one output, which means a whole lot of signal level and a whole lot of distortion. And I have a very short clip of what that sounds like. Um, oh, great. The, the original, yes, yes, the original old style team chat. It's only a 20 second video. And again, forgive the reach, um, but you I have, uh, no, you really don't, you really don't but I have an example of what that sounded like uh, as we aired it. Oh boy. Forgot I had to re-unmute. So, so there you go. There's a perfect example of of what it sounded like, and it's it's very compressed. It's you know it's at the top of the physical hardware's uh, capabilities, and there's not much you can do to it. You know, it it sounds okay. You can kind of hear what they're saying, but first of all, it's it's hard to understand what they're saying anyways because they're repeating everything three times. They're really energetic when they're doing it. They're they're saying call outs of specific things. You know, they're, they're at, you know, dumpster three. They're at, you know, uh, castle one. You know, all of the things that they as a team have decided are their, their particular call outs. So it's really hard to understand what they're saying anyways, but then you have everybody yelling at the same time on top of 
the game sounds and with no dynamic room whatsoever just this this hard compressed flat distorted audio sound it's really hard to hear like it's it's a cool feature it's as a listen in it's like okay you get to hear kind of what you know they're, they're great doing, idea. But yeah, it's a great yeah it's a great idea it's brings you a little bit more into the show but it's of limited usefulness and so you know as we started going through this you know John and I luckily are both perfectionists and we both like to go into the hardware and tweak and right and try to figure out every capability you can possibly pull out of it. And so, you know, poor Chris, you know, Chris is the one that we have to send up onto the stage in the middle of a show with a laptop and a USB <laughs> cable and reach over a guy's console and try to, you know, to, excuse me, I just have to unplug you for a second to change some setting that you don't know about during your competition game that's going to cost you money. Well, like because they would switch it. boxes um, in real, like during the game. So, like if a box failed, the player would uh, request a new box, and then they would give a new and box. The new box had every wrong setting possible. Exactly. Yeah, right, yeah. Hardware hardware failures happened. Uh, we didn't have a dedicated set of broadcast boxes. You know, it was it was kind of a limitation of the type of boxes and number of boxes that they had. But for the longest time, we didn't have a dedicated set of broadcast boxes. So they would switch out a box not tell us we would go to do you know a listen in and everything would be wrong so getting back back to were, when you were, said these were consumer grade devices why weren't pro devices used instead uh number one for the particular sponsor that was sponsoring that listen in they didn't okay. make them so um, so these, certainly these, were, these these were a sponsor and therefore, that their equipment had to be used. It was part of the part of the game, so that is totally understandable. Also, it was a preferred piece of equipment that lots of gamers use. It's a very and they're used game. to it, and, and they're, they're used to it. Yeah, right. they're right. used to it. They're familiar with it, right? You don't want to introduce something that's too alien, because then that'll be called. You know, you're stepping on their their form. Then you ask them to catch out in a way that they're not used to doing. That's not really fair for. for yeah, yeah. Yep. Something that's as alien as the way John sounds right now. Try, John, try restarting your camera again. It's it's doing the, uh, the weird uh, thing. Again. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, that's exactly it. So with the hardware that we had available to us, you know, it was in this particular, these are Astro boxes and it was an mm -hmm. Astro gaming listen in. So we use the Astro devices because that's what we had to try to make sound good because, you know, it, it's as much a sales piece as it is anything else, sure. you know. Um, so we had to try to figure some, out how to make those sound better. That's something that everybody should know about this entire event. Not only was there the live uh, video game competition going on uh, and the the audience could come in and play in the open bracket against each other, but the vendors for all, for dozens of different uh, game products from games to headsets to chairs to these uh, listening boxes, we're all there. It was a full-blown convention. Right. It was like an exhibition. Yes. And they were all in the same right. room with the, with the with the show. And right. We also had a DJ. And, and so, <laughs> right. Yeah. There was. I mean, there was a lot of those elements in play. And so, you know, when it comes to me, you know, and and I'm sure John sees it the same way. You know, we're being paid by all of these sponsors. So it's it's your desire to see how you can make these boxes work. Yeah. that makes the sponsor look as good as possible and so that's how uh we eventually came up with the redesign so and it was it was a very collaborative effort you know chris was the one that that showed me the software that pointed out that you could bring out individual microphones and you know i who knows the broadcast side of things you know you look in that first picture the first thing i see is a marshal there's a marshal camera sitting in front of every player's face is well, that what the cameras the marshals, were yes yeah. they, they were all uh, the little marshals um and the marshals can take audio some of them some of the marshals can take audio but these particular ones could take audio so my next thought was okay what if i were to take every mic individually out of everything and send them into these marshall cameras because to john's point it's a lot of extra infrastructure to run all of these things across the stage there's a lot of di boxes involved there's a lot of xlr involved and you're already in a very wire heavy environment with a ton of current everywhere so by sending it into the camera it did multiple things it gave us a ground lift because it's being sent over fiber it gave us uh you know dedicated audio channels because they're already sending audio channels as long as we de-embed them on the other side it, it fit a lot of different bills and 
uh, the the last piece of that uh, kind of special sauce that we came up with was how I treated the audio when it got to me in its individual channels. Um, now that I had the ability to get each microphone individually, now I could make it sound the way it was supposed to sound. So when you're watching a broadcast, uh, you know, the players are on a stage and they're fanned out from left to right. So in order to squeeze extra audio in, it makes sense to put them in a stereo space so that way it's easier to pick out sounds and words from different ears. Now, nothing was hard panned, you know, because as you're watching TV, almost nothing comes hard out of one speaker, hard out of another speaker. It was all very subtle in how it was done, but it was laid out in the direction in which you were watching the broadcast. And that's what made the newer team chats that we developed, which was the first video you heard, sound so much better. Um, it was the, the ability to fan it out in the stereo space. And then that's when John brought up the idea that that works even better in the front of house world, because when you're watching a listen in with a stage in front of you, it makes absolute sense to hard pan things in certain directions and put certain players in certain speakers, because that's how they're coming at you in real life. So we ended up building a separate panning scenario for John versus a separate panning scenario for when it hit my air. And then I got to entire another levels of uh, processing, uh, you know, everything from compounding to, uh, you notice in the uh, the the first uh, video, the, the air box, there would be a little box that would pop up in the corner of your screen with the logo and then the, the players talking. Uh, I tallied every one of those boxes uh, not as full auto faders, but just as subtle bumps. So every time you were looking at a player, everyone else would dip out a little bit, but that particular player would jump up in the mix. And there was dynamics to keep everything within a certain range. But so that way the person you were watching had extra clarity compared to everybody else who was also talking. They were all intelligible, but you could really hear what you saw on the video, which in our world, you know, my entire job is making things sound like what you see. And so it worked really, really well that way. Um, and that's had, that's kind of start. the... We had a rough start getting that yes. going. We we were actually ready to go with it one time. And I think we ran into a problem. Uh, we were having a ground loop issue between the the boxes and the cameras. And it ended yeah, up being we, something right. we, so, we couldn't use. We couldn't go with we couldn't go with it on that show. But we got some ISO, little uh, unbalanced ISO transformers to make that link between the two of them. and. The, the next time that we had it up, we got we were all very excited. We got right up to that point in the broadcast mm -hmm. and we crossed our fingers and we brought up these new versions of team chats. And the uh, I was actually out of the audience and I was uh, I don't think the front of house console had moved to the audience yet. I think it was still I think it was still something backstage. Uh, so I was out with my iPad controlling it and um, was watching around me and this first team chat came on and the the sounds were spread out all across the the spectrum and people in the audience were pointing up at the speakers at the space in the air above where all these sound sources were coming from lots of people were suddenly noticing that this was way different they were literally pointing up and the guy would talk and the person would point over to that so it was a visceral response and we also got a lot of response online we followed some of those Twitch chat things, there was definitely people talking about it because it was very different. It made a huge, huge difference in how that that extra layer that we were able to add in um, added something to this look in feature, this listen in. It was a big deal. Mm -hmm. It was well received. Yeah, absolutely. Mark, do you have something? It sounds a lot better. No, I'm just listening to you guys and my head's freaking <laughs> spinning. <laughs> That's, that's audio, that's about right? That's audio. <laughs> yeah, I had a, sounds about I had right. enough stuff to deal with with LED walls and projection mapping and all that other crap. So. Yep. Yep. And so yeah, just to give everyone uh, a, an example of of what it really sounded like, um, I do have one last clip that I brought with me. Um, and basically, what I've done with it is I've taken all of the extra noise out. So it, this is an actually aired team chat but I've removed the effects sounds, I've removed the game sounds, and I've removed the announcers. So you can hear what the team chat sounded like as it was coming from the individual boxes, going down the cameras, being de-embedded, going through my processing. 
uh, and then out into my uh, my broadcast fanned out panning, uh, which again is less severe than what John uses just because of the, the differences in the, in the medium. Um, but I do have the one last video so that you can hear the difference from that uh, the last video you heard, which was very heavily compressed, uh, to what it eventually became in its purest form. And uh, here we go. You guys need to back up, back I'm up, not sure call and I'm listen. Not sure. Okay. Yeah, the hot, the hot. Two, two, three, four, 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 Nice, uh, nice. Quite close. No, I see. Hold. I'm out. I'm out. Hold. Hold. Trying to hold. 18, 18, can he absolute? Every trophy. Every trophy. 18, can he? 18, can he? Can he? Sorry, team. 18, 18, 18. Back to two, team. 18, one shot. Yellow heading here too. Okay, triple shot. One guy flanked. One guy flanked. Yo, back, back, get back, right truck. Sorry, he's up right now, Kaden. I'm trying to help. I'm boxing. I'm boxing. Side in, out dead. And there you go. That's that's the eventual product we came up with, which again is still a little bit of chaos, but compared to to what it started out to be, it 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 improved it quite a you know leaps and bounds. You can actually pick out English words out of all of the soup that's coming at you. Sounds like a normal TV control room with the director and AD yelling at everybody. That's that's exactly what my room sounds like with a hot mic of the director, a hot mic of the producer, a hot mic of the exactly. AD, the talent exactly. talk back. That's every moment of my on-air life is what that sounds like. So I've got a few questions. So that's, yeah, go right ahead. Um, are team chats controlled by the comms department? Thankfully not. Yes, definitely they were all not. Done, they were all done by audio and Chris. They, they handled all that. So they... That was all done because it's basically in Dante. It's just a matter of pushing a couple of magic Dante buttons and you're done. Um, on the Omnio cards, we use the Omnio cards for Omnio KP panels in a couple of situations. We use the little converter boxes uh, that we ran over the network to went into regular KP panels. And also the, the transport of IFBs to the studio technology boxes. Those were all on Dante. All of the announcers were Dante Studio uh, 215 boxes, right? Mm -hmm. yep. So there were there were uh, uh, 12 boxes, I think, total we have. Five at the uh, analyst table and three at each uh, two other places, not 12, but 11. But before, when I first came to this show, they were not Dante. So there was a lot of XLR being run all over the place and different inputs and outputs, and it just saved saved the world going there. Um, the, uh, the the studio technology box it basically runs straight into the Atom system as well as the comms as well as the console. Uh, so all of the IFB was straight into there because we used the Omnio in for them on the same network. Um, <laughs> AV Trainer thinks, do you think that TV trucks will ever really go IP-based audio? Well, I know a couple of new trucks have just been built that are 100% IP audio and video. Uh, so it and that's a, there's actually, that there's something really interesting with that. So, um, yes, there are absolutely trucks out there that are 100% IP. Um, they have had their own issues. You know, I've, I've watched a, a Fox NFL show go off the air. Uh, I've spoken to the TV truck engineers about why that was. And it, you know, it 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 always ends up being really, really high level networking stuff. You know, and uh, the like Fox that thirty five dollar uh, DHCP server. That's exactly. exactly it, right. In this particular pie. case, the NFL game that went off the air was in Minneapolis, and uh, it was the 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 long story short of it was uh, they run something uh, that's that basically prevents the network from looping back to itself and creating a packet storm. It's called spanning tree protocol. And it's it's a little more advanced. It's better than STPv2. It's a little different. But um, spanning tree has to be configured so that when something goes wrong, the network knows who to bail to. And in their case, they never set that up. 
And mm. so there's a there's an election process, and the last uh, line of the election process is who's got the lowest serial number. In their case, the lowest serial number was the switch in the booth, I believe is what it was. So it was right. one of the smallest switches, which all of the traffic in the world started flowing through, and it just ate the show alive. So there are you have to really, really know your your networking to get to that level of it. That being yeah. said, you know, that's 2110. That's another, that's another world. That's so much more data than what Dante pushes. Yeah. As far yeah. as Dante is concerned, I think Dante is 100% ready for TV trucks now. I have had so much experience with the booth boxes, with all of the little nitpicky problems you can run into. Uh, it is so much more reliable than DT, and that's hard for me to say. Copper is always the better option. The Dante setup is so yeah. good, especially good. if you build your network the way that I built it with the built-in redundancy, the LACP, if your chips that allows redundancy in your Dante stream, if you right. build it that way, it's not going to go off the air. And more importantly, it's a single wire. So you're not running an XLR for your microphone, for your IFB, for your talkback. It cleans up the desk space. It looks better on camera. It's a better sound quality. You don't have to worry about ground loops. You don't have to worry about any of that stuff. It is yep. so it's much EMI better proof. from every if you're aspect. On, if you're on uh, fiber, it's EMI proof. You're, yep. All that's gone. Totally EMI proof. You don't have to worry about building grounds. I've done so many college football games where everything works until the moment they turn on the stadium lights and then my entire show goes away. Uh, it happens. You know. I've been told well, so we, many times how fragile fiber is. Well, compared to every yeah. other cable on earth, it's incredibly yeah. robust. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, you know, when you get to a scenario where like uh, Duke, for example, you park the TV truck down the street blocks away from the venue where you're at there's no other way to do that but fiber so just embrace it you know just know that there's a really good solution out there and it's dante and it's ready uh dan newburn wants to know how does the observer system work i can take that um so yeah. in the tv truck um we have xboxes or playstations or pcs whatever uh, the the game type that we're using is um, and the observer is basically the cameras within the game. It's like your director of photographer or uh, photography. So there's actually uh, someone that's really skilled in the game that flies around through the different scenes and is um, basically your the, the director's or the production director's eyes. Um, so he can pick which player he wants to see. He can pick wide shots. And there's actually a, there's actually a video on YouTube I was watching the other day about how to observe. It's amazing. Like I didn't realize how in depth it was, um, but it's definitely something to check out. Um, and basically, that just comes in as a, um, a HDMI into you know some sort of uh, FS1 or whatever that gets converted over to to video. So uh, the um, the people that are the observers have to be in contact with the uh, referees that are on the on the floor because the referees are watching all the players to see if everything's okay, also to see if all the equipment is working right. And so part of the intercom system was a free speak, a wireless intercom system to referees, and they had to talk to their individual observers. So there were lots of, uh, there were A, B, C, D observers they had to talk to. Uh, on, on top of that, there were production people out on the floor, stage managers uh, who had to talk to the production side of it. So when we, we originally started out with uh, the uh, FreeSpeak system, we had a single standalone base, which only gave us 10 channels to talk to. And uh, uh, it was very hard to divide up all those ABC reservers, everything. So we ultimately synchronized two bases and put half the belt packs on one, half the belt packs on other, but then got 10 inputs for each of the two bases. And the 10 inputs are the eight, four, four wires, four, two wires, uh, the program SA and the headset jack on the front gives you a total of 10 inputs. Uh, but the comm system evolved a lot over time because 
I, I would be sitting there and somebody from the truck would come over and say, do you think I could talk to so-and-so? Well, you've never had to talk to them before. Well, the game is changing. We've got to do something different. It's it, it, this, and I need to be able to talk to all of them and they need to talk. So there's all this kind of imagination about uh, how they want to communicate, which often didn't communicate very well to me. Oh. <laughs> um, but but it was a terrific. I, I was really excited about working on that show, and it's a shame that it, it, that that series of this version of the show has gone away because it was a real challenge. Particularly working with all of you uh, was absolutely. Don't worry, we got experience. some more challenges for you, buddy. <laughs> oh, that's good. That's good. And and uh, Parker, by the way, was on the uh, listen was listening. So. Hi, Parker. You're great. Hi, Parker. <laughs> well, Parker is my friend from across and know something about Thailand as well. So what it come? Parker, uh, yes, definitely. So there were a lot of questions we didn't get to, but mostly um, uh, <clears throat> were covered when we talked about it, just not specifically at the moment. So these questions will be listed with the, with the video and you can go back and watch his video as much as you want on YouTube and or our 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 uh, our, our own, own website, website. Our, our own website. Um, and the this the, these questions will be uh, posted with them, so we can get back and refer back to them. And the, and they're posted with let's say the time into the show that we actually sort of dealt with that answer. Um, I do want to say that uh, coming up on Wednesday. We have a, a terrific show about uh, touring A1 mixing, being an A1 uh, audio person and touring. Several different A1s are coming to talk. And then, strangely enough, on Friday, Studio Technologies is going to come and do a show about all of the stuff that we've been talking about right here. Actually, even more than that. But 90% of what they're talking about is Dante. I mean, that isn't what they, they do a lot of stuff other than Dante, but it's evolved into being the most important part. Uh, and it, it, they're a terrific little box of, of tricks. And uh, it, it made this show immensely easier to do. And a couple of people said, well, who was your IT person? Who was doing all the programming and everything? And, and the reality is it was John and Jason. Right, and even Chris, <laughs> Chris was even there. Chris was involved in it as well. And so, and actually, so the funny story about that, Pete, um, the <laughs> network redesign that I showed you, um, that came about very late uh, in the off season uh, for this particular game. Uh, that gear, uh, the first site that we went to for that was Las Vegas, and uh, we site. decided we were yeah. Oh God, it was one of the one of the hardest days i've ever worked in any type of capacity and you're welcome i i <laughs> yeah thanks um i ended up having to get all of the gear shipped to my house along with enough accessory gear to build an entire las vegas convention center in my living room to commission all the gear and to try to make it work and it was all based on guesses that once we once we got to site, we changed, you know, some for better, some for worse, you know, some for physical reasons, some for electronic or logic reasons. But, you know, that was that was interesting. But, yes, I had to build that entire thing. I had fiber running from my kitchen table over to the couch and there was another switch on the couch and then there was another piece of fiber that went into my bedroom. It, it was nuts. But that's that's how we got that on the air. But yes, I had to I had to tech the IT for that myself. I try not to let people know, but I have a heavy IT background and a heavy video engineering background. Uh, the the reason I don't let well, people know is because then they ask. Pretty much one in the same. It's pretty much one in the same now. You can't anymore. Yeah. Them. Yeah. Anymore it is, and the reason I try not to tell people is because then they ask you to fix things, and that's just I, I don't want to do that. Uh, okay. Listen, I've got this thing uh, that I need fixed. Uh, exactly. Oh, been also, there. In, in this line of Dante integration, later in the month, we are also going to be having a session, uh, not only with the Studio Technologies, but later uh, with uh, SSL and their broadcast series consoles, which are entirely Dante based. And uh, I mean, they do have an Finally. excellent M Maddie to Dante interface. But 
finally a console that has Dante built into it. Right. And yeah. uh, I'm, hey, currently, I'm currently yeah. currently using one uh, uh, several days a week and mm -hmm. uh, quite happy. I take it back. Calrec does have a little integration now. They've got two different boxes that they're starting to come along. They were really dragging their feet for a while. They only allowed Dante in their in their road boxes, but not in their console boxes. They're coming along. I should I should be nice to credit where credit's due, Calrec. Uh, uh, Mark Brown wants to know who the incredible tech manager was. It seemed very complicated. Uh, <laughs> But on the other hand, he kept this all in 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 shape, and there was always this meeting you were required to come to first thing in the morning with your and occasionally staff. bacon. He kept and us occasion. bacon. Oh, well, there was yeah. one time when we got delivered um, uh, food from catering, and it was the, the the lamest breakfast you'd ever had. It was like buns, <laughs> and that was it. And he Seattle. complained to them, and we got. Said there's no bacon. If immediately there was 50 pounds of bacon on the table. Oh yeah, that was that was um that was Florida. Yep, that was Miami. Yeah, exactly. and, and if you remember, before that bacon showed up, I ended up walking down the street and I put in a $200 McDonald's order and brought it back just to try to get everyone through uh, that bacon. day. Just hey, because the show was I don't, It's fine with me. <laughs> um, I there was one it. more technical question here. Uh, was there any noticeable latency difference between the player's audio, announcer's audio, audio embedded cameras, and game audio? Was there any issue with latency in this show that you remember? It's a good question. The only the only outstanding latency issue that we had in terms of going to broadcast and dealing with different sources and making sure they were synchronized was our wireless cameras that were wirelessly sending and using a packet system for transmitting their, their source, their signals. And because it had to be reassembled, there was a, a, a buffer and there was latency that was you know accrued mm. and the, the picture was late. And we would match a wireless mic to some of these cameras when they would either do a live spot or uh, they would tape something that would, they would uh, film something and it would go to a record in the truck for playback later. Oh, we, had, we, had to, we had to work very hard to constantly match the delay that was put into the microphone to match that the delay for the from the video and it was a process where we would have to change it every once in a while as the rf profile would change in the room and we'd have to find new frequencies or mark would have to retime or change some of the the way that the codec was working we'd get different numbers we'd have to sort of keep updating that that was an well, interesting there was also we there was also the issue of mic three and mic four Mm -hmm. Which mic three was direct audio, mic four was was delayed audio because yeah, so, so let me let me spell that out record, recorded we were all we all had some fingers in this so let yeah Jason will have a, a little piece of this too right so uh, we had for our particular show for our stage we had four microphones we had in uh, microphone number one and microphone number two were for live talking. So that was people on stage being shot by triax or fiber cameras. Um, then we had mic three, which was for live hits from the RF camera. Now the RF camera, again, depending on the codec being used, depending on the the, the settings of quality, other things, uh, could be, I had it as much as 870 milliseconds off. So it was severe, severe. Um, so mic but three was great. specifically for the scenario where we had to do, yeah, it, it was only under specific codecs and only in certain circumstances. Usually it was closer to 400, which is still pretty heavy, but it was, it got as high as in the high 800s. Um, so three was specifically for live hits on the RF camera. And then we had a fourth mic, which was only for offline records, the, oh, by the way, to the, the audio people in the, in television world. Um, and it was specifically so that we knew anytime they grabbed mic four, it was always timed to the camera and it was always recording in tape. So there was never any question because a lot of times all of us are doing five different things. I might be on a bio break and Chris might be mixing my show. Same thing for John. John might, you know, step away from front of house for something and Chris has to cover him or one of our other guys covers him. We had to make sure that no matter what happened, if you turn that microphone on, it went to tape. So that's why we had four microphones and John's absolutely right. That setting that was one of the hardest things, but Dante specifically uh, to the question, uh, cause I know what the, the questioner is getting at. 
the only time we ever had synchronization issues or timing and latency issues was the first time that I went to uh, interrupt and non-interrupt. Uh, so in, in, a, in a regular audio chain, when you think about it, so the microphone comes from the box, goes to the console, and then from the console, uh, it goes into uh, the non-interrupt side of the headset, which in analog world is fine. And then the interrupt side goes from the console into the intercom and then out. So there's an extra step in the interrupt chain. So in Dante world, the first time that we tried doing interrupt and non-interrupt, the sound was just enough out of sync and it was uh, uh, under a couple milliseconds. But Chris put on the headset for the first time and it was, he said it was jarring. He had a hard time talking because, you know, obviously you hear yourself through your own ears and your own head first. Then you hear yourself in one ear a couple milliseconds later and in another ear a couple milliseconds later. And it was oh, man. just tripping everybody up. So what we ended up doing to solve the problem was we had to match the chain. So I would actually send the audio signal for the uh, non-interrupt side through the intercom to do nothing. So it literally went in the Omnio card, went nowhere, and then I forced a cross point so it went out of the card. Just, just so there was enough links in the chain to match the, the path so that way the, the things would come into timing. And so that specifically to your question, that's what you have to watch out for in Dante world because you know those headsets, you know that's a chipset that allows a minimum of five milliseconds per packet. So if your data isn't ready for that five millisecond packet, it comes to on the next packet, five milliseconds out of time. So you have to match everything in your chain to go the same number of hops to keep the audio in exactly the same synchronization. I would nope. like to say one more thing. I'm sorry. Yep. Uh, the video wasn't late. The audio was was uh, early. That's what the problem was. <laughs> exactly. I'm sure that was the way it was. Exactly. So uh, the your, the five one audio you got from the games was following the observer's controller, right? It was yes. the audio out of the observer's game, right? Okay. Yes. So and 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 what? As far as from the broadcast perspective, did you do anything special to mix that, or did you just turn it on? It, so the, the the down mixing was was really the 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 biggest thing we did. We had tried some scenarios where, uh, especially with the A game, uh, we had a backup observer, and we tried to do some things where like we would put that observer somewhere like in the game, like you know floating POV where it was up above, so you could get extra sounds. None of it really made sense because, again, everything I'm doing in the audio room is trying to match what you're seeing on the screen. So everything in perspective only makes sense to whoever's on the screen at that particular time. Mm -hmm. You know, if, if you're if the observer is looking at someone in one corner of the map and you hear gunfire, you your brain thinks there's someone nearby. Well, they may not be. They may be all the way on the other side of the map. So uh, we ended up only sticking with the POV and only sticking with the down mixed audio. So you got the extra content out of the game, but it still made sense to the point of view perspective of what you were watching. Yeah. The um, Eric Kimmel wants to know why we didn't use Bolero or Romeo. He said, because we had free speak. You know, it's not like any one, any one of those has any magic effect over it. And we just came with free speak. So, and the show didn't really need much more than that. Um, free speak mm -hmm. and pie plates. Free speak and and <laughs> pie plates, exactly. Lots of pie. I plates. know you've spoken about the pie plates before. So much. Yes, an entire was... show was saved by pizza. The pizza, right? The pizza's over there, but uh, I won't go get it. That's okay. <laughs> um, I think we could go on forever with these questions here. And I think we've uh, done a do way more. more than our two hours. Uh, uh, wow. So I, I'm going to uh, And you still have to show that here. final video. Oh, no, that's that, that's off the table. We we took that that's away off the for, table. Uh, for licensing no, no. reasons. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we will tell everybody there's an, incredible, there's an incredible video that John made, which someday somebody will see, but we weren't able to download it. <laughs> No, 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 no,
Yeah, we tried anyway, to download for, it, but for, it looks like exactly as bad as the way John looks right now. Exactly. John's de demonstrating right now why we couldn't download it. Another video. Uh, not a chance, no John. Not saying. a chance. No you have no, no idea what you're saying. He has no the advanced, uh, advanced internet plan. It's about uh, 40 kilobits up and down. <laughs> exactly. Yes. And, and if you didn't live kind of in Bangkok, up. you could get a you could get a, a a faster flight here, and you could do it do your and webinar honestly, live. My wife, my wife is pedaling as fast as she can. It's just not going to get more than this. <laughs> I'm sure. I'm sure. Well, thank you sure. for her. Anyway, I want to thank you all for doing this. It's been a really terrific show, and and uh, it, again, I think uh, it, it it shows a lot of the technology that was able to be pulled together with by a bunch of people who were just trying to pull themselves up by their bootstraps to get the show on and using imagination to uh, come up with all kinds of new ideas to make it better. I mean, nobody asked you to make the team chat stereo across the whole thing. It just seemed like, hey, we can do it. And you're mm -hmm. right. I was out there when you did that the first time and the audience just didn't know what they were listening to. They had no idea quite amazing mm -hmm. yep and anyway, it, and it makes if it makes the sponsors happy it it, it makes me happy because it keeps my oh, paycheck yeah. it was pretty cool pretty cool pretty cool mm -hmm. okay well cool. thank you very much for being here and uh we're we open in hartford in a week so we'll see you there <laughs> good night